It was September 12, 1990. In those times, way before instant messaging and Zoom calls, a little girl was looking for pen pals. Zoe was aboard a ship from England to Belgium on vacation with her parents. She was only 10 years old at the time, but was a very clever schoolgirl. She took a piece of paper and started putting some words together. She introduced herself, then wrote about how she liked ballet and playing the flute and the piano. Of course, she couldn't help but mention her two adored pets, a little hamster she called Sparkle and her fish Speckle. She also put down the address at which she could be reached in case someone was interested in writing back to her. But alas, she was at sea. Who could she send this message to? An interesting idea came to her mind. She carefully placed her letter in a plastic bottle, tightly closed the lid to protect it from the water, and threw it into the sea. The little girl's excitement faded away over the years as she didn't receive a response. Maybe the bottle got stuck somewhere. Maybe it was swallowed by some big, scary sea creature. Or maybe the water actually poked through the plastic cap and destroyed her message. Many years later, on Christmas, A letter for Zoe was received at her parents' house under her maiden name. The postage signaled that the message was from Europe. It was from a Dutch couple, Pete and Jacqueline Leteau, who had found her delicate bottle and were very considerate to write back. They pointed out that they had found the letter among the debris thrown at the shore by the sea. Zoe's letter had been stranded for a staggering 23 years at sea and traveled for more than 350 miles to reach its final destination near Rotterdam in the Netherlands. That's quite a voyage for a small plastic bottle. A story similar to that of Zoe is the strange connection between two little boys. A little German boy named Frank Uzbek was on a boat traveling to Denmark when he got the same idea as Zoe. He was five years old at the time he put together a message and threw it into the unknown. The year was 1987. He got his response years later, when he was 29. His letter, just like the one Zoe would send a couple of years later, had been at sea for 24 years. His message was found by a boy named Daniel Korotkin while he was on a walk with his parents on the Koronian Spit near the Baltic Sea. Daniel was lucky that his father knew enough German to translate the message. The unlikely friends eventually met via video call in 2011. Not all message-in-a-bottle stories have been explained away. In 2013, a Croatian surfer came across a damaged bottle while near the Adriatic Sea. The message it contained dated back to 1985, and it was from a man named Jonathan. The sender was eager for his letter to reach a woman named Mary, and he also expressed his keenness for her to respond. Since the letter was supposedly sent from Nova Scotia, The bottle had to have traveled a mind-boggling 3,700 miles. The message went from the Atlantic Ocean, entered the Mediterranean Sea, and reached the Adriatic shores in Croatia. The identities of neither John nor Mary were ever discovered. There are also messages in a bottle with wonderful love stories to share. This was the case for Ake and Paulina Wiking. When Ake, a lonely Swedish sailor, placed a letter in a bottle and threw it in the Mediterranean Sea, he had no idea the piece of paper would eventually reach his future wife. This was in the early 1950s. The bottle was found by an Italian man who was inspired enough to give it to his niece, Paulina. After a year of back-and-forth letters being exchanged, Aki and Paulina eventually met and got married. Having decided to share their story with the world, they became somewhat of a celebrity couple for the time. They even shared video footage of their wedding with the world, and their story was featured in a bunch of newspapers. This fortunate event started a movement between young people looking for love, increasing the number of messages being thrown out at sea in search of a fairy tale ending. Not all the stories that started out like this eventually worked out, though. In 1945, an American named Frank Heostak placed a similar message to that of Aki's in a bottle and threw it in the waters. Almost a year later, his letter was found by an Irish woman. Her name was Brenda O'Sullivan. Their years of correspondence soon caught the attention of the media at the time, but their friendship never flourished because of the added pressure. They eventually met in person when Frank traveled to Ireland, but he didn't stay for long, and they eventually got out of touch with each other. 
After Titanic met its strange ending, many bottles containing secret messages started to surface. Almost all of them proved to be counterfeited, apart from one letter. Years after Titanic had sunk in the icy Atlantic waters, a bottle was found on the Irish shores. It was supposedly from a man named Jeremiah Burke, and to this day, it is considered to be the only genuine message in a bottle originating from Titanic. The piece of paper simply stated the sender's name and the location, the Titanic, accompanied by the word goodbye. Since the date has washed away, it's difficult to estimate whether the note was sent before or after the ship had hit the iceberg. The common understanding is, however, that since Jeremiah was looking to relocate to the US, he was merely sending his last symbolic regards to his family and friends back in Ireland. This simple way of meeting, and sometimes corresponding with people, has turned into a hobby for a man from a Canadian province named Prince Edward Island, located east of the US state of Maine. This man, Harold Hackett, claims to have sent over 4,000 bottles into the Atlantic Ocean since 1996. He also claims to have received many responses from all over the world, including letters from people in Europe, like France and Germany, but also from the Bahamas or even Africa. This unlikely pastime earns him about 150 Christmas cards from his pen pals each year. To this day, he refuses to add his phone number to any of his letters. This way, he ensures that if people ever want to contact him, the only means of doing so is via a written letter. He's also studied the best times to send the messages in the water based on the direction of the winds and the currents. Now, some bottles spend a whole lifetime at sea after being cast away by their sender. It was the case for a British man that wrote a message and placed it into a bottle before throwing it in the English Channel in 1914. His name was Thomas Hughes, and he wanted to direct the message to his wife, but was polite enough to write a letter to whoever got their hands on the bottle first, asking them to redirect the piece of paper accordingly. The bottle didn't reach his wife, since it was found 85 years later on the Essex coast. The man that stumbled upon the bottle was kind enough to reach out to the family and place the message in possession of Thomas's daughter. And 85 years isn't the longest time for a small bottle to be cruising the waves. A scientist named Hunter Brown was studying currents in the North Sea when this idea came to his mind. He placed the same message in almost 2,000 bottles and requested the unlikely recipient that they write back with the location of their discovery. He thought this method would help him better understand the layout of the North Sea currents. A bottle was found about 11 miles from its original departing location after 97 years. To this day, more than 300 of the original bottles relating to Hunter Brown's project eventually made it to the shore. Not all of the messages that were found in bottles got replied to via physical letters. Oliver Vandevala threw a bottle containing a letter on the English coast while he was on vacation with his family. He was 14 at the time. 33 years later, a woman reached out on Facebook claiming she had gotten his message and tracked him down through his social media profile. Hmm. At first, he hardly remembered having placed the letter in the bottle, but he eventually recounted the events, <laughs> even the fact that he sealed the bottle with candle wax to make sure it was leak-proof. And then there's Christina Aguilera and her bottle. No, wait, hers is about a genie in a bottle. Okay, never mind. It was the biggest ship ever built in its time, and it was supposed to be unsinkable. But within days of steaming out on its first voyage in 1912, the Titanic was gone beneath the relentless waves of the North Atlantic Ocean. And of its more than 2,200 passengers and crew, only 706 survived that dreadful night. Would a smaller ship have fared any better in the same situation? Did the size of the iceberg truly matter in the end? Was it a mistake for the ship to change course at the last minute as it tried to avoid impact? These are three questions that have people pondering, what if? We do know that Titanic was considered an engineering marvel in its day. Designed by Thomas Andrews for the British shipping company White Star Line, it was just over 880 feet long and 175 feet tall. 
built with abundant space for 840 staterooms, a swimming pool, a squash court, a gym, and two dining rooms. But it was below deck that one of its most impressive new features could be found. Titanic's hull was divided into 16 compartments designed to be watertight. Up to four of these compartments could take on water in the event of a breach, with the remaining 12 helping to keep the damaged ship afloat. It was thanks to these compartments that the ship was regarded as unsinkable. Rumor has it that Philip Frank, White Star Line's vice president, even declared, There is no danger that Titanic will sink. The boat is unsinkable, and nothing but inconvenience will be suffered by the passengers. On April 14, 1912, that proved to be mistaken when Titanic struck an iceberg. As ice ripped along the ship's hull, several of those watertight compartments ruptured. It took only two and a half hours for Titanic to sink. Did the size of the iceberg that hit Titanic seal its fate? Would a bigger or smaller iceberg have made any difference? Icebergs come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. They are pieces of ice that have broken away from glaciers or ice shelves in the Arctic and Antarctic and are now wandering across the ocean until they eventually melt. One of the tallest icebergs ever found would have easily dwarfed Titanic. Discovered in 1957, it was 550 feet high. That's close to the height of the Washington Monument. Imagine ramming into something that big. Smaller icebergs, though, can turn out just as dangerous. Some are the size of houses and called bergy bits. Others, closer to the size of a car, are called growlers. These can be much harder for ships and boats to locate, making them more difficult to avoid. And, though smaller, they can produce a lot of damage when hit. It's also critical to recall that icebergs are always bigger than they seem, with the majority of their mass lurking below the ocean surface. In fact, over 80% of an iceberg's volume is underwater. Most of its sharp, jagged edges cannot be seen. Roam too close, and you risk damaging your ship's hull. Because Titanic had little notice of its impending doom, a smaller iceberg struck at the same angle could still have been enough to bring that mighty ship down. Now, it's possible that had the iceberg been larger, it would have been spotted sooner. Titanic might have had time to alter course and avoid the impact. But missing that one iceberg would not have guaranteed Titanic safety. It was traveling in a dangerous stretch of the Atlantic called Iceberg Alley. It's located 250 miles east and southeast of Newfoundland, Canada. Behind one iceberg, there could be another, and another after that. And so the crew on board had to remain very attentive to avoid several potential collisions, not just one. A smaller ship might have been better suited for the trip. Titanic's size was certainly a challenge when it came to steering. In fact, it had just left her dock in Southampton when it nearly collided with another smaller ocean liner, the SS New York, missing it by just two feet. The gigantic steamship was obviously not made for maneuvering quickly in tight quarters. A ship that size required time and space to change course. But when it comes to ships versus icebergs, a ship's size doesn't always matter. The Islander was a steamship designed to travel the inside passage in Alaska. In the summer of 1901, it struck an iceberg, which tore a hole in the front portion or bow of the ship. The vessel did not sink right away, and the crew tried to steer it to safety. Ultimately, its bow completely submerged, and its stern was lifted up and out of the water. It didn't take much longer before the ship sank completely. Of the 168 passengers and crew members, 128 survived, and $3 million in gold was lost. Islander had a 240-foot hull, making it almost a quarter of the size of Titanic. And that smaller size didn't seem to be much help in preventing a collision with an iceberg. And then there was the Hans Hedtoff in 1959. Also known as the Little Titanic or the Danish Titanic, it was referred to as the safest ship afloat. It was 272 feet long with 95 people on board. 
Much like the real Titanic, the Hans Hedtoff was specifically engineered to handle most of what the sea could throw its way. Along with its double steel bottom, it also had an armored bow and seven watertight compartments. How could such a ship sink? But it could, and it did. It was on its first voyage, returning to Copenhagen, when it ran into trouble. On January 30th, it hit an iceberg. An SOS was sent, but when the Johannes Cross arrived to help, the Hans Hedtoff was nowhere to be found. The only evidence of the ship's existence was a life belt that was washed ashore in Iceland nine months later. Again, the ship's smaller size didn't work in its favor. A smaller size of Titanic wouldn't have guaranteed a safe voyage in 1912. The final what-if concerns the last-minute choice when the iceberg was spotted and the alarm sounded. First, Titanic could attempt a complete stop. But this wasn't an option, as the ship needed a half a mile to come to a halt, and the iceberg was a mere 900 feet away. Second, the Titanic could attempt to avoid the iceberg by steering away from it. This is what the captain ordered, but the attempt was unsuccessful, resulting in a deep gash across the ship's hull. The final option? To hit the iceberg head-on. Would this have made any difference? The answer is an intriguing maybe. Some think a head-on collision would have saved Titanic. In this scenario, the collision would have limited the damage to the very front of the ship. Instead of the iceberg tearing through the hull and compromising several of the watertight compartments, only four of the compartments would have been breached. This meant the others could do their job of keeping Titanic afloat. The ship could be stuck, unable to move, but it would remain above water until help arrived. This would provide a ship like Carpathia enough time to reach the scene of the accident and bring the people on board to safety. One of the Titanic's designers, Edward Wilding, made a similar claim during an inquiry into the sinking. He argued that most people would have survived a head-on crash, and that Titanic itself would not have sunk. Others disagree, though. First, the special bulkheads on Titanic were designed specifically to protect the ship against collisions with other vessels, not with icebergs. These compartments would crumple upon impact, absorbing some of the force while the other ship absorbed the rest. Though the damage would still be extensive, the remaining bulkheads would keep the ship afloat. But an iceberg does not have the same flex in a collision as you would experience with another ship. Most of the force would be absorbed by Titanic, resulting in greater damage to the ship. Even worse, the impact would be carried through the full length of the ship. Rivets would burst, seams would tear, the compartments would quickly flood, and the ship would sink even faster, resulting in fewer survivors. In any case, as with most what-ifs, we'll never really know the answer. As tragic as Titanic's first and last voyage was, it did result in changes that helped make venturing out to sea much safer. Findings from hearings on the disaster led to the creation of the International Ice Patrol, or ICC, in 1914, an organization that tracks icebergs in the Atlantic and Arctic Oceans to ensure vessels in the area can avoid them. In the US and Britain, ships were obligated to carry enough lifeboats to accommodate every person aboard. Regular lifeboat drills were made mandatory. And finally, the bulkheads on ships were made higher to keep water out, and bottoms were stretched to create double hulls, helping make the compartments truly waterproof. There's no denying that Titanic was a terrible tragedy, but the lessons learned from that night to remember has helped prevent many more. Meet Arthur John Priest. No, he isn't famous for being a painter or for discovering some long-lost treasure. He didn't invent some cool gadget or break any world records. No, Arthur John Priest is famous simply for being unsinkable. Proving one can be both lucky and unlucky at the same time, Priest was involved in and survived several mishaps at sea, including the fateful maiden voyage of the Titanic. Priest was not a rich man interested in sailing for pleasure. He was part of the working class, employed as a stoker or fireman, stuck for hours within the hot bowels of large steam-powered vessels. His job was dirty and difficult. 
He was responsible for keeping the furnaces lit, feeding them coal to ensure enough steam was produced for the engines to work. He had to be careful about not overheating the system or setting fire to the whole ship. The furnaces had to be carefully watched and constantly fed. He breathed it all in a while, working and fighting with the sweat and the dirt. He would often work shirtless because of the heat and was always covered in black coal dust. And when he finally had a break, his shared living quarters were nearby in the same part of the ship. He must have been good at his job though, because he had no trouble finding work. But wherever he went, bad luck seemed to follow. The first incident was a mild one. As a young man, Priest worked on the RMS Asturias. The passenger liner first set sail in 1907, traveling between Southampton in the UK to Buenos Aires in Argentina. At some point during its maiden voyage, the ship suffered a small collision. The damage was bad enough that the ship returned for repairs. Thankfully, there were no reports of any serious injuries. Priest, unfazed, simply went to work on another ship. But his bad luck lingered on the Asturias. In 1914, the Asturias became a hospital ship, helping care for sick men and women around Europe while bringing them home to England. But in March 1917, at just around midnight, the ship was struck by a foreign object. Its hull was breached and the engine room flooded. The captain ordered everyone to abandon the ship, sending crew, patients, and health staff scrambling for the lifeboats. The vessel was still moving, powering through the water because the main controls, located within the flooded engine room, could not be turned off. The captain refused to leave the ship while people were still trying to escape. He was able to aim the Asturias towards Bolt Head, where it finally hit land and couldn't sink. The remaining lifeboats were lowered and the final survivors made it to safety. When they studied the damage on the ship later, the Asturias was declared a total write-off. It might be hard to pin this particular disaster on Priest. After all, he wasn't even on the ship at the time. But it seemed that many of the ships on which he served were destined for trouble. His bad luck followed him to his next job on the RMS Olympic, a massive ocean liner. The Olympic was big. In fact, it had been designed and built as part of the fleet that included the Titanic. But with size came sacrifice. The Olympic was great at moving in one direction, but very difficult to handle when it needed to turn. It was September 1911. The Olympic was trying to alter its course. The Hawk, a smaller ship sailing nearby, didn't give the larger vessel enough room to maneuver, and the two slammed into each other. Because the Hawk was engineered to deal with potential confrontations when out at sea, its reinforced bow tore through the Olympic. Two large gashes appeared on the ocean liner's side, the propeller shaft was badly twisted, and worse, the ship began to take on water. Somehow, the Olympic made it to shore without sinking, and nobody was seriously hurt. Priest had no idea that this was just a small taste of what his future held for him. He next found employment on a brand new ship, a better ship, an unsinkable marvel that was said to be the biggest vessel to have ever been built. Yes, he was going to work on the Titanic. And what a job! It took 29 boilers, requiring 850 tons of coal a day, to produce enough steam to power the Titanic. Priest was just one of 150 stokers toiling away in the ship's underbelly, keeping those fires burning day and night. He made around $30 a month. But on April 14, 1912, he would find himself flung from a world of extreme heat to one of blistering cold. At approximately 11.35 p.m., the crew spotted an iceberg. The Titanic tried to avoid it, but the alarm had been sounded too late. Five minutes later, the two collided. The iceberg tore through the hull, and the once watertight compartments inside were badly ruptured. As the cold Atlantic water flooded in, the ship began to sink. Distress signals were sent, but the closest ship, the Carpathia, was over three hours away. In the dark of night and stuck in the middle of nowhere, the crew and passengers panicked. Those who could scrambled for the lifeboats. Others jumped into the icy waters. In total, only 706 survived that terrible night. Priest, at the time of the collision, was down in the ship's lower quarters. He was on break, relaxing from a hard day of work. And as the ship went down, so did his chances of survival. He and his fellow workers were in the most dangerous position on the ship. 
They had to make their way through a maze of corridors and gangways, some of which were flooded in a mad dash to the deck. And then they faced the frigid water, jumping in and desperately swimming to safety. The ocean was so cold that Priest even suffered frostbite before finding his way onto a lifeboat. He was one of only 44 stokers to survive that night. After an experience like that, most of us would never set foot on a boat again. But Priest had to work. His next job also ended in disaster. He was offered employment on the HMS Alcantara. It went down in 1916, and Priest was again one of the few to make it to safety. He was badly wounded in the process. But he kept pressing his luck, and his next job as a stoker may have felt eerily familiar. He would be working on a ship built by the same people behind both the Olympic and the Titanic. And this ship, named the Britannic, was the biggest of the three. It was also believed to be a superior vessel, fitted with new safety features after the Titanic sank. For example, it had 48 open lifeboats, 46 of which were the largest ever used on a ship before. Two of these were even motorized and equipped with special communication devices. The good news? The Britannic survived its first trip without incident. It was already doing better than the Titanic ever did. However, on November 21st, 1916, the Britannic was shaken by a loud explosion while traveling through the key channel in the Aegean Sea. The hull was damaged, and some of the compartments began to fill with water. But, unlike the Titanic, the Britannic had been designed for just such an emergency. It had been fitted with five watertight bulkheads. Intact, these would help keep the ship safe and floating for a much longer period of time. But there was one issue. Portholes along the lower decks had foolishly been left open. As the ship tilted, the portholes let in water, which flooded the Britannic and hastened its descent into the sea. This effectively made those watertight bulkheads useless. The ship was going down fast, much faster, in fact, than the Titanic had sunk. 35 of the lifeboats were successfully launched, saving most on board. Of the 1,066 passengers and crew, 1,036 survived. Priest, his luck intact, was one of them. And yet, he still wasn't done with a life at sea. He accepted a position as a stoker on the Donegal. It was a smaller passenger ferry that had been converted for use as a hospital boat. In April 1917, it was struck by a foreign object while fleeing an unsafe situation. And though he suffered from a head injury, Priest was again one of the survivors. It took experiencing two collisions and four sinkings before Priest was finally ready to retire. In fact, he reportedly said he only gave it up because no one wanted to sail with him. Can you blame them? He would live out the rest of his life on dry land in Southampton, England, with his wife Annie and their three sons. But Arthur John Priest would always be remembered as the unsinkable stoker. John watched on in disbelief as he drifted away on a piece of wood in the freezing waters of the Arctic, slowly drifting away. John looked upon the vessel he had worked and lived on as it raised its enormous bow high into the sky, then broke in half causing a sound that only a crack of lightning could replicate. Distraught and dumbstruck, believing that he, and he alone, knew the dark truth behind the demise of the unsinkable ship, the Titanic. Five days earlier, as the Titanic set sail on its maiden voyage, John worked hard alongside his mates in the coal bunker, stocking up the coal to feed the Titanic's mighty furnace. They had stocked and stored more than John had ever witnessed on any other ship he'd worked on. But this was the Titanic, the grandest ship to have ever sailed the seas. On the Titanic, there could never be too much coal. As they left Belfast and pushed toward Southampton, there was a large bang below decks that went unnoticed. The furnace was roaring and the turbines were spinning, pushing the Titanic forward at a quickened pace. The crew cheered as the vessel moved forward, unaware of the loud concerning noise. Arriving in Southampton, Greg came aboard, amongst hundreds of other passengers. With 13 years at sea, his vast experience included the role as a quartermaster on six previous ships. Ready for a new challenge aboard the greatest vessel ever made, he was looking forward to this next challenge of his career. Greg came with a wealth of experience, especially with sailing through the Arctic. His role was vital within the crew, understanding the seas around the North Pole. 
He would be a key lookout as they set to cross the perilous path of the Iceberg Alley. Greg had some concerns regarding the voyage. The Earth's orbit was remarkably close to the Sun and the Moon, causing higher tides. This would make icebergs more prominent, drifting them further away and towards the route of the Titanic as they journeyed to New York. Assessing the lookout tower and inspecting the available gear, Greg found no binoculars. This made him concerned, but the sailors just laughed at Greg. If the deck is short on ice cubes, we'll be sure to plow right through a berg to resupply. A sailor laughed. Greg didn't share this sentiment. Eager to find out why they had been left short-handed on equipment, since he had such a vital role on the ship, Greg inquired further. Sadly, the officer with the keys to the binocular supply cupboard had been removed from the crew at the last minute. Greg couldn't believe something of this importance had been overlooked. For such a mighty ship with so many people aboard and crossing in a particularly perilous path, this just didn't make sense. But not wanting to be fined for breaking into the ship's property, Greg let it slide, hoping that they wouldn't need the binoculars in the end. Ultimately, if there were icebergs expected, a warning call would be made to the captain, informing of any concerns. Little did Greg know that a warning had been received, notifying of the dangers that awaited. But the telegram didn't provide the required prefix, which would have ensured direct delivery to the captain. So the critical warning was just overlooked. John and his crew below decks prepared for departure, stoking the engines. He noticed an essence of thick exhaust, far too heavy than what would be expected from the furnaces. The crew searched throughout the lower decks. Following a thorough search, they managed to locate the cause of the exhaust. It was an ignited pile of coal within a coal bunker. Unknown when it had ignited, a buildup of coal had clearly been smoldering, slowly growing in size. The amount of smoldering coal was concerning. The alarm was raised, alerting an officer to review the matter. The officer assessed the damage and confirmed with the captain that it was deemed to be of little concern, as only minor damage had been caused. John was unsure of this assessment, as he knew that in confined spaces, surrounded by iron bulkheads, an oven-like environment arises that intensifies the heat with time. But the Titanic would power forward, making no sense to John as they had only just departed from Southampton. He was sure they would have turned back. John and his crew were ordered to shovel the already lit coal into the furnace and continue shoveling until all the smoldering contents would be contained. It was a possible but painstaking task that could take the entire journey. The continuous intake of coal would ensure the turbines would spin at a constant accelerated pace, not what the Titanic was designed for. It was meant to be a luxurious passenger liner and not for breaking speed records. However, the crew would find enthusiasm in not only acknowledging the Titanic as unsinkable but also as the fastest. John and his crew continued to shovel the coal into the furnace for several days. The temperature within the bow was becoming hotter every day. The bulkhead's contained heat was so severe that it became weak at the seams in the iron walls and rivets. Two more days, lads, just two more days. John was laughing, trying to raise the spirits of his mates as they were working tirelessly. But as they were all laughing, joking, and looking forward to dry land, they unknowingly approached their final destination. The Titanic was speeding through the calm sea. Greg looked ahead, above in the lookout tower, keeping a keen eye out as they were in iceberg territory now. Even though the way seemed clear, false horizons could occur, creating confusion about how far objects in the distance truly were. As they were traveling in the Gulf Stream waters into the colder Labrador current, air columns cooled from the bottom upwards, creating a thermal inversion. This incredibly high air pressure ensured fog wasn't present, providing a deceptively clear outlook. But the thermal inversion can also create optical illusions, showing the horizon further away, appearing higher in the distance, or masking whatever objects that could come before it. These false horizons could easily hide any icebergs that could be approaching. Greg knew the perils of a calm sea in the Arctic, preferring the rough waters, where it's easier to detect icebergs within waves. Peering from the lookout, Greg was looking towards the dark abyss ahead. Suddenly, within one mile directly in front, a formidable image quickly emerged from the dark waters surrounding. Iceberg right ahead! Greg yelled to his mate, who quickly called to the helm, 
and directed them to steer hard to starboard. The helmsman received the call. In the heat of the moment, he turned the wheel counterclockwise. He then realized he'd turned the wheel the wrong way and quickly went in the opposite direction. The ship aimed towards the iceberg, veering to the port side whilst reducing speed. Although there was a delay in turning the wheel, since there was a short distance from the signal and the fast pace that they sailed at, it may not have made a difference. As they approached the iceberg, it appeared as though they'd miss it, but over 87% of an iceberg is underwater. And as they came along the side, the hidden ice underneath hit the port side bow, piercing the side of the hull with a 12 square foot tear. The ship shook, with all aboard aware that something was amiss. Amongst the confusion and fear, they were oblivious of the damage. As they gathered their bearings, six out of 16 compartments were quickly filling up with seawater. The hull could only withstand four compartments filling before sinking. Time was ticking as the Titanic made its descent into the depths. The weakened bulkhead with heated steel pillars and rivets broke under the pressure and sudden change of temperature from the ice-cold water. The call was made to abandon the ship. Lifeboats were prepared to be released, while help signals were sent out to nearby ships. The radio operator was guiltily sitting, constantly calling out to a nearby ship that had been in contact with the Titanic recently. There was steady communication with this ship over the past few days, providing warnings of icebergs since the Titanic departed from Southampton. The final warning message received was just one hour ago. Upon receiving the final warning, the operator ignorantly responded, shut up, with the assumption that their warnings of icebergs were pointless. Following this unfortunate response, the ship turned their radio off and provided radio silence. The closest ship that was responding to their distress signals was 500 miles away, too far to provide any assistance in time. There were countless mistakes that caused the Titanic's watery end, whether they contributed directly or from sheer ignorance. The most tragic of them was the number of people aboard the ship, 2,224 of them. There were only enough lifeboats provided to rescue 1,178, barely half of the people. Can you guess how many theories of the Titanic sinking exist? Right, loads, including a theory of my own, which I'm going to share with you today. And then you can decide which one seems most likely to you. One Piece Theory the very first version of the events was the One Piece Theory. It's very simple and basically claims that the sinking happened without any breakups. 2.15 a.m. The ship collides with an iceberg. 2.18 a.m. The lights go out. The ship reaches an angle of 45 degrees and then quickly begins its final plunge into the ocean depths. 2.20 a.m. Only about three minutes later, the RMS Titanic disappears under the surface of the ocean for good. The liner doesn't break, it just goes down as a whole piece. Of course, this can't be true. In April 1912, the Titanic was not only the largest ship in the world, but also the largest ship ever built. It's hard to believe that such a heavy vessel could have gone down without breaking. That's just impossible. Well, I mean, you can't blame the theorists. Before we found the wreckage, there were no other theories. Wait a minute, or were there? The day after the disaster, the survivors gave their interviews. They talked about what had happened, and some of them claimed that the ship had actually broken in two when it had been flooded. For example, Jack Thayer, a 17-year-old boy, outlined the sinking as he remembered it, and L.D. Skidmon drew a sketch based on his description. The picture clearly showed the ship breaking in half. But no one believed Jack or other witnesses. There was no evidence, so their claims were received with a grain of salt. But in 1985, things changed. First breakup theory. That's when Robert Ballard found the wreckage of the Titanic in the depths of the ocean. When people saw the wreckage, it became clear that Jack and the other survivors had been right. The Titanic did indeed break in two when it sank. So it's time for a new theory. 2.15 a.m. The keel breaks, the starboard list eases, and the hull continues to bow and crumble. 2.17 a.m. The galley sections break off. The towers immediately drop under their own weight. 
the lights go out. The stern is pulled into the air. The bow breaks off and starts sinking. The aft is barely hanging on to the starboard side of the stern section superstructure. The stern section slowly lists over to port as it begins sinking again. It rises up one last time and pivots in a semicircle as it sinks. It all sounds pretty convincing, right? But people began to find plot holes in this theory. For example, the Titanic couldn't have held together until it reached such a high angle. The breakup would have had to begin much earlier. This only meant there was still a vast field for research and speculations. So people started to come up with their own possible scenarios. How about we look first at the ones no one likes? V-break and Aaron 1912 V-break. According to the first breakup theory, the Titanic reached a high angle and the weight of its unsupported stern caused it to crack from the top down. But it's physically impossible. So are there any other ideas? In 2006, Roger Long, a naval architect, decided to research a so-called V-theory. 2.17 a.m. The breakup begins at a shallow angle, perhaps as little as 11 degrees. The upper structure fails and starts to crack. At this moment, only its double bottom is holding the Titanic together, but it starts to bend under the strain too, failing the ship. Water is pouring through the crack. It increases the weight in between the two sections, bending the Titanic the other way and pulling it into shape somewhat resemblant to the letter V. The upper decks get mangled and bent together. The bow heads for the bottom, and the stern is the last to sink. This theory has since been disproven many times, though. Roger Long believed it because the broken edges of the upper decks in the Titanic's bow section were all mangled and crushed. However, we have learned that it happened because of the so-called hydraulic downburst, the force of the water crashing into the deck as the Titanic hit the ocean floor. Another V-break theory states that the bow had risen out of the water after the break. This theory was mainly peddled by one former Titanic enthusiast. But not only has this theory been proved to be physically impossible due to the bow's incredible mass, it was also inspired by incorrect information. Remember Jack Thayer? Well, it was based on his sketch and the words of a couple of passengers. But the truth is, none of them had ever seen the Titanic break down like this. Jack himself even stated in an interview that the sketch was completely out of context to what he had actually seen. It was drawn by a passenger on the Carpathia, the ship that received the Titanic's distress signal and came to its aid. It couldn't be used as evidence. Now that we know this, let's move on to the theories that most people believe in. James Cameron's Banana Peel Theory. Who hasn't seen the legendary movie about the Titanic, right? It became the leader of the 70th Academy Awards ceremony in the number of nominations and awards, and deservedly so. But did you know that James Cameron had been interested in the Titanic for many years and studied the ship's history? His books and research are very detailed, and he even came up with his own version of the events. It's called the Banana Split Theory. And this is actually what you could see in the movie. Here's how it goes. The Titanic reaches a 23 degree angle and fractures down to the keel. The double bottom acts as a hinge as the stern falls down. When the double bottom fails, the bow and the stern separate. The stern lists to port, standing vertically, and then begins to go underwater. This theory is the most scientifically accurate one, along with Roy Mengott's theory. Wait, who's Roy Mengott? Mengott theory. Roy Mengott was an engineer who came up with the most plausible theory for the time being. 2.17 a.m. The lights go out on the Titanic. At this moment, the ship is at an angle of 20 to 23 degrees. Suddenly, the vessel snaps in two just around the third funnel. It causes the stern to settle into the water. The keel fails first. The draft and lower hull are crushed and break apart. Water surges into the bow and stern of the ship through the huge cracks, causing the bow section to sink beneath the waves. The stern rises up to the angle of 70 to 90 degrees, 
and then it sinks too. This theory seems to make the most sense, but it's quite controversial. The survivors who saw the breakup stated that the stern had settled back with the bow completely missing. Mengott's theory, however, contradicts that statement, while James Cameron's scenario takes this into account. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? The truth must be somewhere in the middle. My version. Now, as promised, I'll provide you with my version of the events. Well, it's not really my theory. More like a combination of Roy Mengott's and James Cameron's ones. I believe that James Cameron was right about the breakup. 2.17 a.m. The ship is at a high angle. The lights go out. Then it snaps into two pieces. The bow starts sinking. The double bottom is still attached to the stern for a minute or so. Once the double bottom fails, the two parts separate and the bow goes down. Then, as Mengot said, the stern rises up at a high angle and then it begins to sink vertically. It might have actually happened because the survivors stated that they had seen a clean break. This means it couldn't be hidden. And they had also seen the stern staying vertically in the air for a long enough time probably a few minutes before disappearing. Anyways, all of these are just speculations. Regardless of how the Titanic broke apart and sank, it was a great tragedy. It's already been 110 years since the Titanic collided with an iceberg and sank. Did you know that in 2022, the Blue Star Line Company is completing the construction of an exact replica of the Titanic? Called the Titanic II Liner, the ship will be sent sailing along the same route with 2,400 people on board. Let's hope that everything goes well for them. April 14, 1912. The dark night was filled with horrible sounds of a giant metal vessel breaking into two. The largest ship of that time collided with an iceberg that was on its way. The Titanic, one of the biggest stories of the 20th century that people still talk about. The starboard side of the giant vessel brushed up against the iceberg. It was 11.40 p.m. when things started going wrong. This iceberg caused enough damage for at least five watertight compartments in the hull to start filling with water. The crew immediately began a brief investigation to see if they could do anything and fix things. They had no one to rely on, all alone in the darkness of the cold night, far away from the land the North Atlantic Ocean, around 400 miles south of Newfoundland, Canada. They needed time to figure out how to bring people to safety. They had some time, true, but not enough. If you watched the movie, you know the ship didn't plunge immediately after the icy doom had happened. The whole process lasted a good 2 hours and 40 minutes. But the situation was hard. There were 2,200 people to take care of including crew and passengers, and things happening on the ship were chaotic. The chief designer, Thomas Andrews, soon realized they wouldn't be able to stay afloat. By midnight, the entire crew had begun preparing the lifeboats for launch. They had 20 boats with space for only 1,178 people, which was just a bit more than 50% of the people on board. The order was to get women and children to safety first. Crewmen were there to row and guide the boats. The scene over the next two hours gradually started escalating. The crew members had a task to wake up passengers and warn them something bad was happening. They wanted to place them into a fleet of lifeboats as soon as possible. At 12.15 a.m., some crew members sent out a distress signal. A steamship called Frankfurt was among the first ones that received the message and responded, but they were about 170 nautical miles away. Some other ships also got the message and offered their assistance, but sadly, they were too far away as well. At 12.20 a.m., the canard liner Carpathia got a distress signal from the Titanic and changed its course right away. They were 58 miles away at the time and it would take them more than three hours to get there. 20 minutes later, the crew was lowering the first lifeboat. It was carrying only 27 passengers, although it had room for 65. 
Many of the lifeboats that were launched first were well below capacity. Crew members were worried, thinking the Davids wouldn't be able to hold a fully loaded lifeboat. And in the beginning, many passengers were just too afraid to leave the ship. They still thought Titanic was unsinkable and couldn't imagine the scenario that was going to happen one to two hours later. The crew was firing the first of eight distress rockets. Unsuccessful, no one was close enough to help. By 1.20 a.m., they lowered 10 lifeboats. Number 8 had only 28 people in it. One of the passengers on the number 10 was 9-week-old Melvina Dean. She would later become the last survivor who lived until 2009 and turned 97. It was 2 a.m. already. Three of the collapsible boats were the only lifeboats that remained on the ship. The bow of the vessel had sunk low and had tipped far under the surface. People around it could now clearly see stern propellers above the water. Crew members were lowering collapsible lifeboat D from the roof of the officer's quarters with over 20 passengers in it. As the ship's bow went under, the water was washing collapsible A from the deck. Those 20 people were struggling because their boat was partly filled with water. As crew members were trying to release collapsible B, it fell. Before they righted it, the water swept it off the ship. 30 passengers still managed to find safety on the overturned lifeboat. At 2.17 a.m., the ship's wireless operator decided to transmit one last distress call. A minute later, the light on the ship finally went out. Titanic and all left on board plunged into darkness. The bow continued to sink, and the stern was rising higher above the surface, which placed great strain on the midsection. Horrible sounds were filling the night. Titanic, this massive, legendary ship so many people placed their hopes in and were excited about, broke into two between the third and fourth funnels. Reports would speculate it took about six minutes for the bow section to reach the ocean bottom. The stern settled back in the water before it rose again into a vertical position. It remained in this situation until it finally disappeared into the ocean. At 2.20 a.m., the stern apparently retained air inside and water pressure crushed it as it went down. The stern landed about 2,000 feet away from the bow. People consider the Titanic the fastest ship in the world. They thought it was unsinkable because four of its compartments could be flooded and that still wouldn't cause a critical loss of buoyancy. Its life was problematic since its beginning. While the ship was leaving port, it moved within a couple of feet of the steamer New York. It managed to safely pass by, which was a huge relief for all those worried passengers massed on the ship's decks. Titanic sailed off on the 10th of April. Its first journey was across the highly competitive Atlantic route. On the launch day, the Titanic became the biggest movable object in the history of humankind. 882 feet long, 92 feet wide. Not that big if you compare it with today's ships. The biggest cruise ship in the world today is Royal Caribbean's Symphony of the Seas, which is roughly five times the size of Titanic. If you put that ship in a vertical position, it would be nearly as tall as the Empire State Building, which is 1,250 feet without antennas. But Titanic was a huge attraction back in its time. At one moment of their journey, they stopped in France, after which they made another stop in Ireland. Once the final passengers boarded, the massive ship set out at full speed for their final destination, New York City. Four days after the beginning of its journey, Titanic failed to divert its course from a huge iceberg, the story we all know about. Only 700 people survived and most of them were women and children. The night was extremely cold, one hour and 20 minutes after Titanic had gone down to the bottom of the ocean. Survivors weren't even sure someone was coming to save them. Finally, they saw the light. It was Carpathia coming towards them. 
They came for the people in the lifeboats. The crew brought them aboard and pulled a handful of other passengers out of the water. Many ships tried to contact Titanic a few hours after it sank. Their messages were never returned. Later, when there was an investigation of what really happened, they discovered the Leyland Liner California had been less than 20 miles away when Titanic was sinking. But the crew didn't hear the distress signals coming from Titanic because their radio operator was off-duty. Countries from both sides of the Atlantic were shocked and horrified when they heard details of what happened to Titanic. They decided to make changes to ship operations, rules that would help avoid such events in the future. They held the first international convention for safety of life at sea, where they adopted rules for every ship to have lifeboat space for each passenger on board. Also, lifeboat drills became mandatory. They also decided to establish an international ice patrol. Its main role was to monitor icebergs in the North Atlantic shipping lanes. Ships also needed to maintain a 24-hour radio watch. Titanic wasn't built alone. Because of the size of this magnificent ship and all the new equipment it required, it would have been too expensive as a one-off. So the team built the Titanic alongside two sister ships, and both of them had eventful lifetimes. RMS Olympic came first. It was launched in 1910, and for a whole year was the biggest liner in the world. The Britannic was another sister ship that sailed for a while before it too ended down on the ocean bottom. But only Titanic became a legend and one of the most fascinating stories of modern history. It was the biggest ship ever built in its time, and it was supposed to be unsinkable. But within days of steaming out on its first voyage in 1912, the Titanic was gone beneath the relentless waves of the North Atlantic Ocean. And of its more than 2,200 passengers and crew, only 706 survived that dreadful night. Would a smaller ship have fared any better in the same situation? Did the size of the iceberg truly matter in the end? Was it a mistake for the ship to change course at the last minute as it tried to avoid impact? These are three questions that have people pondering, what if? We do know that Titanic was considered an engineering marvel in its day. Designed by Thomas Andrews for the British shipping company White Star Line, it was just over 880 feet long and 175 feet tall. Built with abundant space for 840 staterooms, a swimming pool, a squash court, a gym, and two dining rooms. But it was below deck that one of its most impressive new features could be found. Titanic's hull was divided into 16 compartments designed to be watertight. Up to four of these compartments could take on water in the event of a breach, with the remaining 12 helping to keep the damaged ship afloat. It was thanks to these compartments that the ship was regarded as unsinkable. Rumor has it that Philip Frank, White Star Line's vice president, even declared, There is no danger that Titanic will sink. The boat is unsinkable, and nothing but inconvenience will be suffered by the passengers. On April 14, 1912, that proved to be mistaken when Titanic struck an iceberg. As ice ripped along the ship's hull, several of those watertight compartments ruptured. It took only two and a half hours for Titanic to sink. Did the size of the iceberg that hit Titanic seal its fate? Would a bigger or smaller iceberg have made any difference? Icebergs come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. They are pieces of ice that have broken away from glaciers or ice shelves in the Arctic and Antarctic, and are now wandering across the ocean until they eventually melt. One of the tallest icebergs ever found would have easily dwarfed Titanic. Discovered in 1957, it was 550 feet high. That's close to the height of the Washington Monument. Imagine ramming into something that big. Smaller icebergs, though, can turn out just as dangerous. Some are the size of houses and called bergy bits. Others, closer to the size of a car, are called growlers. 
These can be much harder for ships and boats to locate, making them more difficult to avoid. And though smaller, they can produce a lot of damage when hit. It's also critical to recall that icebergs are always bigger than they seem, with the majority of their mass lurking below the ocean surface. In fact, over 80% of an iceberg's volume is underwater. Most of its sharp, jagged edges cannot be seen. Roam too close, and you risk damaging your ship's hull. Because Titanic had little notice of its impending doom, a smaller iceberg struck at the same angle could still have been enough to bring that mighty ship down. Now, it's possible that had the iceberg been larger, it would have been spotted sooner. Titanic might have had time to alter course and avoid the impact. But missing that one iceberg would not have guaranteed Titanic's safety. It was traveling in a dangerous stretch of the Atlantic called Iceberg Alley. It's located 250 miles east and southeast of Newfoundland, Canada. Behind one iceberg, there could be another, and another after that. And so the crew on board had to remain very attentive to avoid several potential collisions, not just one. A smaller ship might have been better suited for the trip. Titanic's size was certainly a challenge when it came to steering. In fact, it had just left her dock in Southampton when it nearly collided with another smaller ocean liner, the SS New York, missing it by just two feet. The gigantic steamship was obviously not made for maneuvering quickly in tight quarters. A ship that size required time and space to change course. But when it comes to ships versus icebergs, a ship's size doesn't always matter. The Islander was a steamship designed to travel the inside passage in Alaska. In the summer of 1901, it struck an iceberg, which tore a hole in the front portion or bow of the ship. The vessel did not sink right away, and the crew tried to steer it to safety. Ultimately, its bow completely submerged, and its stern was lifted up and out of the water. It didn't take much longer before the ship sank completely. Of the 168 passengers and crew members, 128 survived, and $3 million in gold was lost. Islander had a 240-foot hull, making it almost a quarter of the size of Titanic. And that smaller size didn't seem to be much help in preventing a collision with an iceberg. And then there was the Hans Hedtoff in 1959. Also known as the Little Titanic or the Danish Titanic, it was referred to as the safest ship afloat. It was 272 feet long with 95 people on board. Much like the real Titanic, the Hans Hedtoff was specifically engineered to handle most of what the sea could throw its way. Along with its double steel bottom, it also had an armored bow and seven watertight compartments. How could such a ship sink? But it could, and it did. It was on its first voyage, returning to Copenhagen, when it ran into trouble. On January 30th, it hit an iceberg. An SOS was sent, but when the Johannes Kross arrived to help, the Hans Hedtoff was nowhere to be found. The only evidence of the ship's existence was a life belt that was washed ashore in Iceland nine months later. Again, the ship's smaller size didn't work in its favor. A smaller size of Titanic wouldn't have guaranteed a safe voyage in 1912. The final what-if concerns the last-minute choice when the iceberg was spotted and the alarm sounded. First, Titanic could attempt a complete stop. But this wasn't an option, as the ship needed a half a mile to come to a halt, and the iceberg was a mere 900 feet away. Second, the Titanic could attempt to avoid the iceberg by steering away from it. This is what the captain ordered, but the attempt was unsuccessful, resulting in a deep gash across the ship's hull. The final option? To hit the iceberg head-on. Would this have made any difference? The answer is an intriguing maybe. Some think a head-on collision would have saved Titanic. In this scenario, the collision would have limited the damage to the very front of the ship. Instead of the iceberg tearing through the hull and compromising several of the watertight compartments, only four of the compartments would have been breached. This meant the others could do their job of keeping Titanic afloat. The ship could be stuck, unable to move, but it would remain above water until help arrived. 
This would provide a ship like Carpathia enough time to reach the scene of the accident and bring the people on board to safety. One of the Titanic's designers, Edward Wilding, made a similar claim during an inquiry into the sinking. He argued that most people would have survived a head-on crash, and that Titanic itself would not have sunk. Others disagree, though. First, the special bulkheads on Titanic were designed specifically to protect the ship against collisions with other vessels, not with icebergs. These compartments would crumple upon impact, absorbing some of the force while the other ship absorbed the rest. Though the damage would still be extensive, the remaining bulkheads would keep the ship afloat. But an iceberg does not have the same flex in a collision as you would experience with another ship. Most of the force would be absorbed by Titanic, resulting in greater damage to the ship. Even worse, the impact would be carried through the full length of the ship. Rivets would burst, seams would tear, the compartments would quickly flood, and the ship would sink even faster, resulting in fewer survivors. In any case, as with most what-ifs, we'll never really know the answer. As tragic as Titanic's first and last voyage was, it did result in changes that helped make venturing out to sea much safer. Findings from hearings on the disaster led to the creation of the International Ice Patrol, or ICC, in 1914, an organization that tracks icebergs in the Atlantic and Arctic Oceans to ensure vessels in the area can avoid them. In the US and Britain, ships were obligated to carry enough lifeboats to accommodate every person aboard. Regular lifeboat drills were made mandatory. And finally, the bulkheads on ships were made higher to keep water out, and bottoms were stretched to create double hulls, helping make the compartments truly waterproof. There's no denying that Titanic was a terrible tragedy, but the lessons learned from that night to remember has helped prevent many more. Meet Arthur John Priest. No, he isn't famous for being a painter or for discovering some long-lost treasure. He didn't invent some cool gadget or break any world records. No, Arthur John Priest is famous simply for being unsinkable. Proving one can be both lucky and unlucky at the same time, Priest was involved in and survived several mishaps at sea, including the fateful maiden voyage of the Titanic. Priest was not a rich man interested in sailing for pleasure. He was part of the working class, employed as a stoker or fireman, stuck for hours within the hot bowels of large steam-powered vessels. His job was dirty and difficult. He was responsible for keeping the furnaces lit, feeding them coal to ensure enough steam was produced for the engines to work. He had to be careful about not overheating the system or setting fire to the whole ship. The furnaces had to be carefully watched and constantly fed. He breathed it all in a while working and fighting with the sweat and the dirt. He would often work shirtless because of the heat and was always covered in black coal dust. And when he finally had a break, his shared living quarters were nearby in the same part of the ship. He must have been good at his job though, because he had no trouble finding work. But wherever he went, bad luck seemed to follow. The first incident was a mild one. As a young man, Priest worked on the RMS Asturias, The passenger liner first set sail in 1907, traveling between Southampton in the UK to Buenos Aires in Argentina. At some point during its maiden voyage, the ship suffered a small collision. The damage was bad enough that the ship returned for repairs. Thankfully, there were no reports of any serious injuries. Priest, unfazed, simply went to work on another ship. But his bad luck lingered on the Asturias. In 1914, the Asturias became a hospital ship helping care for sick men and women around Europe while bringing them home to England. But in March 1917, at just around midnight, the ship was struck by a foreign object. Its hull was breached and the engine room flooded. The captain ordered everyone to abandon the ship, sending crew, patients, and health staff scrambling for the lifeboats. The vessel was still moving, powering through the water because the main controls, located within the flooded engine room, could not be turned off. The captain refused to leave the ship while people were still trying to escape. He was able to aim the Asturias towards Bolt Head, where it finally hit land and couldn't sink. The remaining lifeboats were lowered and the final survivors made it to safety. 
When they studied the damage on the ship later, the Asturias was declared a total write-off. It might be hard to pin this particular disaster on Priest. After all, he wasn't even on the ship at the time. But it seemed that many of the ships on which he served were destined for trouble. His bad luck followed him to his next job on the RMS Olympic, a massive ocean liner. The Olympic was big. In fact, it had been designed and built as part of the fleet that included the Titanic. But with size came sacrifice. The Olympic was great at moving in one direction, but very difficult to handle when it needed to turn. It was September 1911. The Olympic was trying to alter its course. The Hawk, a smaller ship sailing nearby, didn't give the larger vessel enough room to maneuver, and the two slammed into each other. Because the Hawk was engineered to deal with potential confrontations when out at sea, its reinforced bow tore through the Olympic. Two large gashes appeared on the ocean liner's side. The propeller shaft was badly twisted. And worse, the ship began to take on water. Somehow, the Olympic made it to shore without sinking, and nobody was seriously hurt. Priest had no idea that this was just a small taste of what his future held for him. He next found employment on a brand new ship, a better ship, an unsinkable marvel that was said to be the biggest vessel to have ever been built. Yes, he was going to work on the Titanic. And what a job. It took 29 boilers, requiring 850 tons of coal a day, to produce enough steam to power the Titanic. Priest was just one of 150 stokers toiling away in the ship's underbelly, keeping those fires burning day and night. He made around $30 a month. But on April 14, 1912, he would find himself flung from a world of extreme heat to one of blistering cold. At approximately 11.35 p.m., the crew spotted an iceberg. The Titanic tried to avoid it, but the alarm had been sounded too late. Five minutes later, the two collided. The iceberg tore through the hull, and the once watertight compartments inside were badly ruptured. As the cold Atlantic water flooded in, the ship began to sink. Distress signals were sent, but the closest ship, the Carpathia, was over three hours away. In the dark of night and stuck in the middle of nowhere, the crew and passengers panicked. Those who could scrambled for the lifeboats. Others jumped into the icy waters. In total, only 706 survived that terrible night. Priest, at the time of the collision, was down in the ship's lower quarters. He was on break, relaxing from a hard day of work. And as the ship went down, so did his chances of survival. He and his fellow workers were in the most dangerous position on the ship. They had to make their way through a maze of corridors and gangways, some of which were flooded in a mad dash to the deck. And then they faced the frigid water, jumping in and desperately swimming to safety. The ocean was so cold that Priest even suffered frostbite before finding his way onto a lifeboat. He was one of only 44 stokers to survive that night. After an experience like that, most of us would never set foot on a boat again. But Priest had to work. His next job also ended in disaster. He was offered employment on the HMS Alcantara. It went down in 1916, and Priest was again one of the few to make it to safety. He was badly wounded in the process. But he kept pressing his luck, and his next job as a stoker may have felt eerily familiar. He would be working on a ship built by the same people behind both the Olympic and the Titanic. And this ship, named the Britannic, was the biggest of the three. It was also believed to be a superior vessel, fitted with new safety features after the Titanic sank. For example, it had 48 open lifeboats, 46 of which were the largest ever used on a ship before. Two of these were even motorized and equipped with special communication devices. The good news? The Britannic survived its first trip without incident. It was already doing better than the Titanic ever did. However, on November 21st, 1916, the Britannic was shaken by a loud explosion while traveling through the key channel in the Aegean Sea. The hull was damaged, and some of the compartments began to fill with water. But, unlike the Titanic, the Britannic had been designed for just such an emergency. It had been fitted with five watertight bulkheads. Intact, these would help keep the ship safe and floating for a much longer period of time. But there was one issue. Portholes along the lower decks had foolishly been left open. As the ship tilted, 
the portholes let in water, which flooded the Britannic and hastened its descent into the sea. This effectively made those watertight bulkheads useless. The ship was going down fast, much faster, in fact, than the Titanic had sunk. 35 of the lifeboats were successfully launched, saving most on board. Of the 1,066 passengers and crew, 1,036 survived. Priest, his luck intact, was one of them. And yet, he still wasn't done with a life at sea. He accepted a position as a stoker on the Donegal. It was a smaller passenger ferry that had been converted for use as a hospital boat. In April 1917, it was struck by a foreign object while fleeing an unsafe situation. And though he suffered from a head injury, Priest was again one of the survivors. It took experiencing two collisions and four sinkings before Priest was finally ready to retire. In fact, he reportedly said he only gave it up because no one wanted to sail with him. Can you blame them? He would live out the rest of his life on dry land in Southampton, England, with his wife Annie and their three sons. But Arthur John Priest would always be remembered as the unsinkable stoker. At the beginning of the 20th century, somewhere off the coast of West Africa, a German steamship was leaving the port. Suddenly, the weather got worse and the vessel entered a thick fog. The sailors ran aground on a sandbank close to the shore. Luckily, no one was hurt, and they were even able to save their precious cargo. But the ship was stuck in the sand for good. And it was not alone there. Nearly the entire length of the western coast of Namibia is called Skeleton Coast. If the name sounds scary, that's because it is. This 976-mile-long beach line is among the most dangerous places on Earth. The local Bushmen tribes believe that their supreme deity made this land when it was angry. The Portuguese were the first Europeans to set foot in Namibia in the 15th century. And yep, they didn't like Skeleton Coast either. Portuguese explorers thought this land presented the gates to the underworld. This is the place where the Namib Desert meets the Atlantic Ocean. It might be dangerous, but it's actually beautiful. Plus, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. If Skeleton Coast had a PR manager, they would quit on the first day on the job. The area is not exactly tourist friendly because of its geography and history. Beneath the sand and the waves, there is a secret ocean currently lurking for unsuspecting sailors. It's called Benguela Current. It flows towards the north along the coast of Southern Africa. This part of the Atlantic is rich in marine life, but the current's land neighbor isn't that happy with the deal. This arid climate created the Namib Desert, one of the driest regions on Earth. And that marine life I just mentioned? It's sharks. 11 species of them to be exact. And yes, the great white decides to pop by once in a while. So far, we've got a desert landscape, strong currents, and sharks. Not a place for a beachside resort, definitely. But if someone ends up on Skeleton Coast, will they know they're in danger? Don't worry, they will. The beach is littered with wrecks of all sizes and shapes. If you remember that German ship I mentioned in the very beginning, its massive and rusted stern is now sticking out from the desert sand. There are some 500 wrecks in total scattered along the coast. And it's a mixed crowd, from Portuguese galleons centuries old to ships that ran ashore here in the 21st century. A modern fishing ship called Zela India managed to slip from its tow rope in 2008 and ended up on Skeleton Coast. Okay, it didn't escape on its own, it had some help from the elements. But it's better to be a tourist attraction on a beach than to be broken up for scrap. That's where the trawler was originally going, poor thing. Skeleton Coast's most famous inhabitant to call it such a place is the wreck of the Dunedin Star. The British cargo liner ran aground here in 1942. The massive rescue operation that followed reveals why it's so dangerous for sailors to end up here. The rescuers managed to save all of the crew and passengers, but at a heavy price. An aircraft and a tugboat were lost in the process. It took the last of the rescuers a full two months to return home to Cape Town. Why, you might wonder? One look at the map of the region reveals the reason. It's an endless sea of yellow, which is the sand. There are so few roads here, so Skeleton Coast is hard to reach by land. 
There are also legal obstacles. You need a special permit to drive into the area. But the skeletons in the name of the area don't only refer to ships. They also stand for animal bones. Most of these belong to whales and seals. Many animals have adapted to the area, so lions and hyenas roam the coastline in search of a meal. Yeah, now there are hungry lions as well, as if those sharks weren't enough. Other animals with a temporary residence on Skeleton Coast include elephants, cheetahs, leopards, and giraffes. In 1971, the Namibian authorities established a national park here. But except for surfers, after an adrenaline rush, they don't get many visitors. You can understand why. The Namib Desert is the oldest desert in the world, and it's not very tourist-friendly either. Those who travel to the region should pack sunscreen and a warm winter jacket. A weird combo, right? Well, not so much when you think that during the day, temperatures soar over 110 degrees Fahrenheit. At night, the air temperature drops below freezing. What a climate roller coaster! And that's not the final danger. Yep, there's more. Remember how that German ship got lost in thick fog? Yeah, it wasn't a one-off event. Because of the region's climate, fog shows up frequently. Sailors should cover their ears now, but this fog is actually good for wildlife. This is their only source of water in the Namib Desert. Reptiles and mammals have adapted to the harsh climate. They use as little water as possible. Shifting sands, thick fog, strong currents, lions, and sharks. Not the stuff you would put in a tourist booklet, but Skeleton Coast isn't the only beach on Earth you wouldn't want to spend your vacation on. I will take you to Cape Tribulation in Australia. The area covers some 48 square miles in the northwestern part of the continent. And no, the area is not as dry as Skeleton Coast. It's part of the Daintree Rainforest. You could say that here, it is the rainforest, not the desert that meets the ocean. The beach at Cape Tribulation is straight from a postcard. But looks can be deceiving. Hmm, Australia? Probably sharks. No, crocodiles are out here to get you if you decide to go for a dip in the sea. There are saltwater crocodiles that the locals call salties. Well, that's a cute nickname for such a dangerous reptile. And it's not just them. The wildlife seems to have a beef with visitors. From October to June, the waters around Cape Tribulation are full of box jellyfish. Their venom affects the human cardiovascular system. When touched by a jellyfish out at sea, swimmers won't have enough time to reach land for help. Vinegar helps neutralize the sting, so you might want to keep a spare bottle in your luggage. Crocodiles and jellyfish sound dangerous, but there's one more animal you should look after. It's the wild boar. It might sound funny, but you won't laugh when you're being chased by one of these across the beach. 21 million wild boars live in Australia. They're mostly active at night, making it even more dangerous if they charge at you. The best defense is running in circles. Wild boars can't cut corners well. That's probably why we don't see many of them taking up careers as race drivers. Cape Tribulation has one last danger installed for you, and it's not an animal. Out here, even the trees are plotting against visitors. The stinging tree got its name for a reason. If you try to pick one of its beautiful red berries, it'll fight back. Its prickles are like tiny glass shards. The less than pleasant effect on your skin will last for a month. Then there is this wait a while bush. Who keeps naming them like this? This long vine has spikes that grab hold and just don't let go. They are so strong, they can pull a human off a horse. You'll have to wait for someone to come by and save you from this thorny grabber. If you are about to cross this Australian beach from the vacation list, hold on for a second. Tourism is booming here. The local authorities have restricted access to all of the danger zones. Visitors go swimming in dreamy water holes that are surrounded by lush vegetation. There are even ropes to swing from. Now, that's a beach you can finally relax. The year was 1854, and the SS Arctic, the fastest passenger liner of its time, set out to cross the Atlantic. As it sailed through the misty veil, it slowly disappeared into the unknown. The Collins Line, an American shipping company, was started in 1818 
and only began seriously trading in the transatlantic by 1835. Its steamships crossed the Atlantic from Liverpool to New York within just 10 days. Doesn't sound like a great speed today, I know, but back then, the same thing took other ships several weeks. Light on the water with their wooden hulls, powering through with a strong steam engine, those steamships were the favorite choice for many high-profile people. What could go wrong with such an advanced ship, they thought. This reminds me of some other ship everyone believed to be unsinkable. But anyway, back to the Collins Line. It grew to be a serious contender on transatlantic routes, with only one other competitor, the Cunard's Line. It was a British company also aiming to be the main force through the Arctic Passage. In 1835, the company received a new ship that traveled to Liverpool and came back to New York with the largest cargo ever at that time. From then, the Collins Line was steadily growing. It seemed like there would only be future successes for it. Unfortunately, their lavish ships became costly to run with the amount of coal used. Massive power along with weak wooden hulls meant they needed many repairs after each voyage. So, every trip ended up being expensive. But since the ships were safe and had a great reputation, people were willing to pay the price, and the company was definitely not in crisis. They had achieved something no one had managed to do before them. Like I told you, their ships crossed the Atlantic in a whopping 10 days. And Edward Collins, the owner, was very determined to maintain the pace. Their five ships easily outran the Cunard's line of only three. With this great praise, it provided more attention. Though the Cunard's ships were slower with their iron hulls, they believed there was still profit regardless of how slowly they sailed. Among Collins' ships, the Arctic, the third of them to be launched, was the largest, reaching 284 feet long with two side-lever steam engines, each with 1,000 horsepower. The paddle wheels made 16 revolutions a minute when at full speed. At the time of its launch, the press called it the most stupendous vessel ever constructed in the United States. But glamour and fame couldn't avoid what would come next. On the 27th of September, the Arctic was on its journey from Liverpool to New York, continuing a speed pace through the thick fog. It's possible that by that moment, after four years of record-breaking trips, the crew became overconfident with their sailing and the ship. Going only 50 miles from Newfoundland, they carelessly continued through the fog with no radio contact, sonar, or any other form of identifying objects, equipped only with Morse code. A smaller ship, the SS Vesta, which operated as a fishing vessel, often worked around Newfoundland. It was passing through the same path as the Arctic and crashed into its side. Shocked by the collision, the captain of the Arctic offered help to the much smaller Vesta but it was soon clear that the damage that seemed minor on the Arctic was far worse. Beneath the waterline, a hole was letting water into the hull. The cost of the much faster wooden hull now seemed less valuable. They steered toward land, trying to plug the holes, but they weren't doing so well, and the seawater continued to pour in, filling up higher and pushing the ship down. And finally, once the engine room was full, it put out the boilers taking away the massive power the Arctic was once legendary for. They moved slowly until coming to a complete stop. The ship continued to sink, and the order was to abandon it. At the time, maritime law allowed for the Arctic to carry only six lifeboats, only capable of saving 180 people. The crew and some of the passengers managed to push their way aboard and took most of the seats on those boats. Things were pretty wild, and everyone forgot about their manners, not letting the ladies and the youngest ones board first. It took four hours for the Arctic to sink. 150 crew and 250 passengers were on board. Those that weren't able to find a lifeboat made a desperate attempt to build their own rafts from parts of the ship. Two days later, only three boats made it safely to the shore. The other three were never found. Believe it or not, the rescue party also saved some people that had been clinging to the wreckage for two days. 
Unlike the crew, the captain went down with the Arctic, but amazingly survived. He would be only one of 85 people that made it out of the 400 on board. When the news arrived two weeks later, the public responded with great sadness to the losses. Great anger soon followed towards the poor safety measures and the crew. The press published demands to change the laws for more lifeboats. It only made sense to have enough for every person on board a ship. But they ignored those requests. This neglect would lead to more disasters in the future. Enough lifeboats would only come into maritime law some 60 years later, after the disaster of the Titanic. Edward Collins' wife and two children were also aboard the ship and didn't return. He was heartbroken, but didn't stop running his business. The Collins line still had a reputation to uphold, the biggest, fastest, and most luxurious on the Atlantic. Edward Collins would now build an even better ship than any other. It was named the Adriatic, and it was the largest ship in the world, 354 feet long. With two alternating steam engines that had never been built of this size, these steam engines at the time were at the height of engineering, though today you can only see them in models and toys. With the new addition of two masts, the Adriatic would also be able to sail if needed. Luckily, they made some lessons from the disaster of the Arctic. But before their new ship, the Adriatic, was built, another disaster had occurred. The sister ship of the Arctic had also sunk. They believed this second ship was desperate to stay in front of the Cunard's line and hit an iceberg somewhere during the race. This weird contest took the lives of 141 people. The desperation of Collins and his weakly built hulls pushed the company towards bankruptcy in 1858. The newly built Adriatic, costing over $1 million, had only made one voyage in the end. And even that voyage was considered a disaster. The ship collided with a tugboat. It still managed to finish its maiden voyage at a suitable time. After the company had gone bankrupt, they had to sell the ship for only $50,000. They removed the great giant engines, replacing them with only sails. Although it was once the greatest ship on the high seas, it was only 30 years later until it was abandoned, labeled irreparable, and anchored in a river. The other remaining ships were also sold and only used for parts. Edward Collins left the industry altogether, seeking work on dry land instead. As the Collins line was no longer in the mix, the Cunards would grow in strength. Without competition, they would win the Blue Ribbon for the next 30 years and 180 years later, after producing hundreds of ships. They still have a constant presence on the seas as they provide transatlantic crossings, world voyages, and leisure cruises. To this day, the Cunard Line is the only one to run ships between Europe and America, and it's great proof that it's not always the fastest that's the best. More than 25 million people boarded cruise ships globally back in 2017. It may not seem like a lot, but that's more than the total population of Belgium. It's a great vacation alternative with an added bonus. You can sample various different destinations for future time off in one single trip. If you've already booked a trip on a cruise ship, but you still have no idea what you should pack, start with some research on your specific cruise location. Either way, be sure to bring deck-friendly shoes that are low-heeled. Also, add a pair that's comfortable to walk on larger distances for the days spent ashore. Depending on the season, you might want to add a few swimsuits too. If you're on any type of medication, make sure you bring it with you in its original packaging. If you're a light packer, don't worry. Most cruise ships come equipped with laundry rooms. They're kind of pricey, especially if you want your garments to be washed, ironed, and folded for you. But it does save you the extra hassle of packing more clothes or washing them for yourself. It's really important that you check in with your credit card company before boarding a ship, more so if your itinerary includes one or more foreign countries. Your credit card might get frozen if there's any unusual activity on your account. 
Most of these companies have algorithms that get triggered once there are charges from different countries in rapid succession, which is exactly what you'll be doing on a cruise ship. Letting them know beforehand saves you the embarrassment of having your car declined at some fancy restaurant. To make sure you get the best room, before booking it, check out the ship's deck plan. It should be available on their website. If it's peace and tranquility you're looking for, don't go for the rooms directly above or below any of the ship's entertainment points. Also, if you have a history of getting seasick, try to skip the rooms that are available at the front of the ship. Rather, go for those located in the middle of the ship on a lower deck. You'll feel less movement. If it's your first time going on a cruise, you might be surprised to know that some cabin rooms don't have windows. Before making a reservation, make sure to check out all the amenities of the room you intend to book. Most cruise liners add a bunch of pictures from the common rooms on their reservation pages, and it might be a bit confusing as to what you're getting exactly for that specific price point. Also, some rooms on board are quite small too. If you don't like to sleep in small spaces, you might want to upgrade to a larger room, even if it's a bit pricier. You can always split the cost with a friend if they want to join you on the cruise. With the help of modern technology, even if a specific location doesn't have windows, it doesn't mean you can't watch the waves. How, you might ask? Fancier cruise ships feature a secret added bonus. In the areas with no access to sunlight, specialists have built virtual balconies. These high-tech screens work by showing you what's going on outside in real time. They have an added benefit too. In case of bad weather, guests can still have a feel of the outdoors without the wind or rain ruining their hair or their outfit. It may not be the real deal, but it still beats getting claustrophobic on board. Planning on going on a budget cruise? It might not be such a bad idea, especially if you're on the lookout for last minute upgrades. You might even end up vacationing like a millionaire without having to spend money like one. These upgrades sometimes include things like a private balcony in your room, maybe some spa services, or even better prices for high-end meals. If they aren't all booked by the time people board the ship, they might be open for the rest of the passengers for way better prices than initially listed. There might be hidden freebies on board if you pay close attention. Things like complimentary pastries on board late in the morning or a late night cup of tea on the house might be some of the things offered to guests. You only need to ask. You might want to check out what other tourists are doing. Some people with more experience cruising can offer pretty great tips and tricks. Don't be afraid to start a conversation if you see someone getting something for free. Some cruise ships do go all the way on the fancy dial. They even have exclusive areas designed for guests staying in expensive suites. Most of the time, they're located at the top of the ship. On one particular cruise, these types of guests have designated staff members called Royal Genies, which are similar to butlers. They can cater to just a few cabins. Since the cruise line wants to divert other guests from asking them various questions, which will take time away from their assigned guests, the genies do not wear a name tag in public areas. Most common areas of cruise ships do require travelers to follow a dress code, but if you do your research in advance, you might find that some areas are more relaxed when it comes to what people need to wear. Most cruise ships require people to adhere to smart attire, which means pants with a collared shirt for men, or blouses and skirts, dresses, or stylish pants for the ladies. As for the travel destinations, be sure to research the ports you're about to visit in advance. You'll know what to wear, what the weather will be, and if you need to pack anything else, like an umbrella or a beach towel. Stops on cruises only last for a few hours in most cases, so you'll want to get the most out of them. If that specific location includes museums or art galleries you want to add to your checklist, be sure to book in advance so you don't waste time waiting in lines. Some cruise ships even provide their guests with private tours of the ports they're about to visit. Do make sure to book them in advance if this is something you might be interested in as the list gets pretty full quite fast. Independent tours are a bit more private, 
you can spend time with your tour guide and even ask more questions. Always remember to put your phone in airplane mode while on board. Most cruise ship horror stories involve cruising newbies that ended up paying thousands of dollars in cell phone charges while on ships just because they forgot to turn it off. If you're the type of person that can't switch off their phone, be sure to check with your cell phone provider before traveling internationally. Some can provide special plans for limited amounts of time without extra charges. You'll be free to chat, call, or browse YouTube videos without worrying you'll end up paying a fortune. Most cruise ships also provide you with complimentary Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi packages that can be purchased in advance, which are way more affordable. You can stick to communicating with your friends and family back home via FaceTime or Skype. People that have heard about the Titanic tragedy will always wonder what might happen if something goes wrong while on board. Let's take lifeboats, for instance. The Titanic had a mere 20 lifeboats on board, which were tragically not enough to fit all the passengers after the ship hit the iceberg. Some fancy cruise ships these days have an even lower number of lifeboats, anywhere from 15 to 18. Sounds strange? Well, not really, given the fact that each lifeboat can accommodate up to 370 people. Even the largest ships, which have an estimated capacity of 8,000 people if fully booked, including tourists and staff, are safe in case of an emergency. The Megalodon was the biggest shark to ever live. Not only that, it's one of the biggest fish and the largest predator in Earth's history. They've been known to reach lengths of up to a whopping 70 feet. That's over three times longer than the biggest great white shark on record. The females have also been found to be around twice the size of the males. The Megalodon could swallow a small car without it even touching its teeth, if cars had been around that. Its teeth could grow to over 7 inches long. It looks like we're going to need a bigger boat, and best make it steel-plated, as this shark can easily gnaw its way through ships. The underwater terror could bite a ship clean in half, with the highest bite force ever calculated for any animal, living or extinct. The force of its ferocious bite was up to 40,000 pounds. That's around 108,000 times the strength of a human's, and 10 times the force of a modern crocodile's bite. Its chomp is so strong that it makes the T-Rex's bite look about as powerful as my granny's after she's taken her dentures out. In fact, the Meg was so big and powerful that it had no natural predators. It was the uncrowned king of the seas, swimming freely from ocean to ocean. This cosmopolitan creature was found all over the world, from America to Europe and Australia to Japan, assuming there were countries back then. Meg fossils have been found on every continent except Antarctica. Everybody skips Antarctica. Science tells us that the Megalodon went extinct over 3.6 million years ago. But could they still be alive at the deepest depths of the ocean? Only around 80% of the ocean has been explored, and its deepest point, the Mariana Trench, is over 7 miles down. So who knows what's lurking at the bottom? If you did manage to make it down, it is unlikely that you'll run into a meg, though. The sharks, like us, preferred warmer coastal waters. Deep ocean living would be too cold for the beasts, and food would be scarce. Their entire bodies would also have to evolve to avoid being squished by the enormous water pressure down there. It's unlikely they're still around, but not impossible. Some good news if you do run into one is that the shark is pretty unlikely to eat you. You are way too small a meal for the megalodon, even if you have a couple of friends with you. This guy eats whales that are over 50 feet long. If you're having a beach party, though, it's a different story. In a beach full of swimmers, the shark very well might creep up, scooping several humans into its giant mouth without even chewing. But wait, let's rewind. How does the shark take down a 50-foot whale? It first bites off its fins, making the whale unable to swim away. It then casually munches it down piece by piece. Because of their size, sharks had to consume over a ton of food every single day just to sustain themselves, like me. All that food made the megalodon extremely heavy. They range from anywhere between 50 to over 100 tons. For context, that's around the same as 7 to 16 adult male African elephants. To fit all this food in, their jaws had to open pretty wide. A megalodon's jaw could span 9 by 11 feet wide. That's easily big enough to swallow two adult humans side by side. 
The fearsome name Megalodon comes from two Greek words, mega meaning big and odont meaning tooth. So combined, they mean what? Big tooth. And it certainly lives up to its name. Just one of its chompers is the same size as a human head. It had 276 humongous teeth in total across five terrifying rows. In all of history, only a couple of saber-toothed cats and the T-Rex had consistently bigger teeth. Now that's a showdown I'd like to watch. The Megalodon vanished millions of years ago, leaving only huge teeth to be found by modern archaeologists. They literally disappeared with very few traces left. Scientists believe that, over time, sea levels dropped and the ocean temperatures went down rapidly. Over a third of all marine life was wiped out as the oceans cooled and a number of animals at the bottom of the food chain plummeted. This had a catastrophic effect on the hungry predators at the top. Sorry guys. It became way too cold for these sun-loving sharks too, which made it difficult for them to reproduce since they gave birth in warm waters. The megalodon is usually described as a sort of giant great white shark, but this is just a common myth. In fact, the ancestors of today's great white existed at the same time as the meg. But they weren't best buddies, and were even in competition with each other. The great white shark was a better hunter, using its smaller size and agility to snap up the meg's prey quickly. They were also known to eat meg pups, who were only half their size. This didn't help the whole extinction thing. Even infant megalodons were huge, coming in at just under 7 feet. While a great white was no match for an adult meg in a head-to-head fight, they sure weren't scared of stealing their food. This only left the bigger fish in whales for the meg, but its food supplies began to run out as the whales swam to the cooler new seas. The whales adapted to prefer the colder temperatures, leaving our friend the meg behind. The megalodons either starved or were frozen into extinction by the Ice Age. Rather than a great white, the megalodon is more like a modern bull shark. It had a short snout, flat lower jaw, and huge pectoral fins to support its massive weight and size. As scary as they are, these sharks were actually caring family guys. Several megalodon nursery areas have been discovered in Florida, Maryland, and Panama. They gave birth to their young in shallow water environments. We know this from discovering loads of tiny megalodon teeth found in these areas. Gee, I wonder if they had nannies, too. But how come there are so many megalodon teeth out there for us to analyze? Well, due to their messy, aggressive eating habits, sharks regularly lose their teeth. They lose a set of teeth every one to two weeks. That's 40,000 teeth in a lifetime. They must rake in a fortune from the tooth fairy. Because of this, their teeth were continuously raining down to the ocean floor. Luckily for us, they're also the hardest part of a shark skeleton, which is why so many teeth have survived and become fossilized. It's fair to say that the first discoveries of the Meg's teeth confused people. Early discoverers thought the Meg's teeth were petrified tongues of ancient serpent creatures. They even used to call them tongue stones. It's also a common myth that the Megalodon was around at the same time as the dinosaurs, although this would have been pretty cool. The dinosaurs were wiped out around 66 million years ago, but the Megalodons came much later. The oldest Meg fossil is only around 23 million years old, but it's tricky to pinpoint the exact date. After all, calendars weren't invented yet. They became extinct way before humans even evolved. The earliest Homo sapiens, which is a fancy name for the first humans, emerged about 2.5 million years ago. But what if the megalodon shark didn't go extinct? Whale populations have dropped drastically since these guys were last round, so there'd be way fewer whales for them to chomp down on. Whales have also gotten a lot smarter and learned new defensive moves, making them way harder to take down. It's estimated that they ate around 12 tons of food each day. If they were still around and eating that much, they'd be forced to eat smaller fish, and there'd be barely enough big fish for us humans to survive on. The naughty megalodons would also be able to track fishing boats and steal the fish that they worked hard to collect. It's safe to say we'd see a lot less fish in the aisles of your neighborhood supermarket. As our ocean temperatures are heating up again, the sharks would also thrive and reproduce faster than ever. There'd be more and more of these giant eating machines in the water, reducing our fish supply even more. It would also cause massive problems for cargo ships and cruising vessels. Imagine coming into contact with one of these bad boys while you're sunbathing on the deck. Even beachgoers would be hard hit. Megalodons give birth in shallow waters, so many of our favorite beaches would quickly become dangerous shark nursing grounds. Hey, where did that beach volleyball game go? They were playing just a moment ago. 
Lights, camera, action. Many of us can't even imagine a world without movies, but sharks probably don't feel the same. A study revealed that the global population of sharks and rays took a nosedive by more than 71% between 1970 and 2018. And guess who's feeling a bit fishy about it? None other than legendary filmmaker Steven Spielberg. Let's take a look at what Jaws got wrong about these toothy creatures. Sharks are not vengeful. In Jaws, The Revenge, the great white shark takes on the role of a vengeful villain seeking revenge against the humans who dared to cross its path. Let's set the record straight. Sharks don't possess the cognitive capacity for grudges or revenge plots. They're simple creatures following their instincts, reacting to their environment, and doing their sharky thing. It means that these animals don't target humans as prey. The movie made us a little more cautious during beach outings, painting the great white shark as a human-seeking missile of hunger. Most shark attacks occur due to cases of mistaken identity, where a curious shark mistakes a splashing swimmer for a delectable seal or other marine critters. The great white shark in the movie is portrayed as a remorseless, mindless beast driven solely by its insatiable appetite for carnage. In reality, sharks are intelligent and curious creatures, playing crucial roles in maintaining the delicate balance of our ocean's ecosystems. Plus, they aren't all the same. Jaws may have popularized the image of the great white shark as the quintessential shark, but the reality is far more diverse. There are over 500 different species of sharks, each with its own unique characteristics, behavior, and personality. They're like a vibrant cast of oceanic characters, each playing their part in the grand underwater production. Turns out, Spielberg is swimming in a sea of guilt over this mega-hit summer blockbuster from 1975. In an interview, the director, who was just a newbie at the time, expressed his concern about the film's unintended consequences on shark populations. Now, before we blame Spielberg for all the woves of the deep blue, let's dive deeper into the details. Some experts argue that people would have been fishing for sharks regardless of the movie. I'll call this theory the Jaws myth. Sadly, it turns out that the most significant effect is the shark fin trade. They are also unintentionally caught in colossal numbers as accidental bycatch. Picture this. In unregulated areas of the Pacific Ocean, where 70% of the world's tuna is fished, baited nets as long as 100 miles are set to catch those sought-after fish. But guess what? These nets often end up snaring even more sharks than tuna. From the iconic da dum da dum score to the legendary you're gonna need a bigger boat line, Jaws introduced sharks to the masses and instilled a primal fear in the public consciousness. The movie's reputation has been swimming in troubled waters due to its portrayal of these magnificent creatures as vengeful monsters. Jaws may have made us think twice about dipping our toes into the ocean, but it's crucial to remember that it's a work of fiction designed to entertain and thrill. Funny enough, decades later, Finding Nemo mentioned the fear Jaws imposed on the audience with a twist. Do you remember the scene where Nemo and his friends encounter a group of sharks called the Fish Friendly Sharks? This scene presents a humorous take on the perception of sharks as predators and challenges the stereotype. Speaking of Finding Nemo, did you know the movie actually took its toll on the real-life clownfish population? After the movie came out and became a huge hit, People loved Nemo so much that they started buying their own clownfish as pets. Sales of these fish skyrocketed by up to 40%. The problem is these clownfish are usually taken from the ocean, which isn't great for their natural habitats. It kind of goes against the movie's message of leaving fish in the sea. Oops. Even though the movie promoted conservation, people went in the opposite direction. Turns out, America is the biggest buyer of these tropical fish, with over 400,000 of them being shipped into the country each year. That's a lot of fish. It's causing some serious issues, like the local extinction of clownfish in certain areas. Next up, the Harry Potter series. The popularity of owls as pets rose after the Harry Potter books and movies were released. While the impact on wild owl populations may not be as significant as with marine fish, there were concerns about people obtaining owls without proper knowledge of their care, 
leading to abandonment or mistreatment. After the Harry Potter movies came out, lots of fans went crazy for owls. They wanted to have an adorable companion just like Harry's Hedwig. Taking care of an owl is no piece of cake. These feathered friends can live up to 20 years and require a lot of attention. So what happened? Well, once the Harry Potter storm eased, many owl owners realized they weren't ready for such a pet and got tired. Rescue centers all over the UK were overflowing with abandoned owls. Yep, people just couldn't handle the responsibility anymore, and poor owls ended up in the rescue centers. You see, owning an owl isn't a walk in the park. You need a big aviary, which can cost around $1,150. And these magnificent creatures need space to spread their wings. Surprisingly, keeping an owl without a license is legal, but releasing a captive owl into the wild can land you six months in jail or a fine of around $6,300. Harry Potter author J.K. Rowling has even pleaded with fans to think twice before getting an owl as a pet. She's made it clear that owls deserve more than being locked up in small cages. Instead, she suggests sponsoring an owl at a bird sanctuary where you can visit and ensure that your feathered friend leads a happy and healthy life. What about the 101 Dalmatians movie from 1961? This Disney film popularized Dalmatian dogs as pets, resulting in a surge in demand for the breed. Unfortunately, the popularity led to irresponsible breeding practices and the overbreeding of Dalmatians, which subsequently caused numerous health and temperament issues. To uncover these insights, scientists delved into data from the American Kennel Club, which keeps track of over 65 million dogs in its registry. They analyzed 87 dog-centric films, including favorites like The Shaggy Dog. The Twilight Saga portrays wolves, which sparked many people's interest in wolf-like dog species. However, many individuals were not adequately prepared to care for these animals. These magnificent creatures are not your typical dogs. They require ample space, energy, and special attention. According to specialists, there has been a 120% surge in wolf-like breeds, such as Huskies, Malmutes, and Akitas being surrendered to rescue centers across the UK alone, not to mention the rest of the world. Let's blame it on Jacob Black. In 2012, when the Twilight Saga Breaking Dawn Part 2 was released, the shelter welcomed nearly 100 Huskies, 35 Akitas, and 16 Malamutes into their loving care. It's not just animals that gained popularity thanks to the Twilight movies. Remember the scene where the Bellward couple dined in a restaurant? Well, in the book and the movie, Bella enjoyed mushroom ravioli, and this dish became incredibly popular. Initially, fans flocked to the fork to taste it, but the demand became so high that the company started producing frozen ravioli, making it accessible to everyone. And this fascinating relationship between food and movies isn't limited to Twilight. To all the boys I've loved before, unexpectedly boosted yogurt sales. Since the movie appeared on Netflix, Korean yogurt sales have skyrocketed. Even the stock market got in on the action, with shares rising by approximately 2.6%. Fans particularly loved the scene when Peter tried the yogurt for the first time. Mm. And don't forget Game of Thrones. The popularity of the direwolf, a fictional species in the series, led to an increased demand for certain dog breeds resembling direwolves, like the Northern Inuit dog. I mean, this didn't directly impact wild wolf populations, but it did result in overbreeding and unethical practices. It seems like fantasy is a lot easier to handle than reality. Have you ever heard of an island that is regularly attacked by sharks? For many years, people living there haven't been able to find a way to stop this. Neither can they understand why sharks come there so often. So, what's going on? Why do these predators keep bothering this specific island while completely ignoring the others in the area? Let's go to this mysterious place and try to find out. July 22, 2015. The ocean waters near Reunion Island were clear and transparent. The western part of the island, St. Lou, had always been a great spot for surfing. But on this pleasant sunny day, 
one of the locals almost lost his life. A six-foot bull shark appeared out of nowhere. Once right next to the shore, it suddenly charged at surfer Rodolphe Ariagui, his friend, doctor, and professor of geography at the University of La Reunion. Erwan Lagabriel was nearby, talking with two other surfers at that moment. Suddenly, they heard some noise. Realizing that it was his friend, Lagabriel rushed to help. The shark was 65 feet away from him. He said that all of this felt like some kind of a horror movie. He rushed to Ariagi, even though he didn't understand what exactly had happened. At first, Ariagi's body was surrounded by white foam. It then began to turn pink, and then red. La Gabrielle said later that it had been one of the scariest things he had seen in his life. Fortunately, when he swam closer, the shark had already been gone. La Gabrielle knew that in most cases, a second attack doesn't happen. So he hurried to help his friend. It took them some time to get back to the shore. When La Gabrielle pulled his friend onto the beach, he immediately made a tourniquet from a surfboard leash. After that, Monsieur Ariagui was rushed to the hospital. Fortunately, this story has a good ending. Although the 45-year-old man lost his arm, he still survived. But he was one of the few lucky ones. Because this horrifying story is just one of dozens that happened on Reunion Island in recent decades. Reunion Island is one of the regions of France. It's located right near Madagascar, together with its neighbor, Mauritius. They're both located at the same latitude as Australia. These two islands are very similar. They have almost the same climate and natural conditions, similar languages and cultures. But there's one huge difference between the two of them. In Mauritius, people can relax and have fun in the warm waters of the Indian Ocean, swimming with scuba gear and watching dolphins. Meanwhile, on La Reunion, locals are afraid even to put their fingers in the water. But why is that? Unfortunately, Reunion now has a strong reputation as a shark island. By 2018, 56 attacks had occurred there. From 2011 to 2016, the number of these cases accounted for 16% of the worldwide shark attacks. Now there are warning signs everywhere on Reunion. Local citizens and fishers have begun to discuss the options of large-scale shark trapping. The authorities forbid people to swim almost everywhere, except for a few more or less safe places, like, for example, a coral lagoon. And still, any fisher or scientist knows that sharks can easily get inside these coral rings. In other words, locals and tourists can't feel completely safe anywhere on the island. Meanwhile, in Mauritius, the last shark attack happened in the 1980s. People come here to relax, and everything is perfectly fine. So the question is, why in the world is La Reunion so unlucky? Dr. La Gabrielle, the hero I mentioned before, set himself the goal of explaining this strange phenomenon. His study showed that over the past 30 years, the probability of a shark attack on Reunion had increased by 23 times. And in 9 out of 10 cases, it turns out to be a bull shark. If you haven't heard about it, this creature looks exactly like what you would imagine when you hear the word shark. It's one of the most popular species and the one that you often see in different movies and cartoons. These sharks live in tropical and subtropical waters in all oceans. Most often, they're found, yeah, you've probably already guessed, in the southern waters between Australia and South Africa. This place is even nicknamed a shark highway because these predators really, really like to chill around there. This is also one of the most aggressive shark species, and it's very dangerous for humans. Unfortunately, it's also very tolerant to different water salinity, which means they can basically swim even in fresh water and be totally cool with it. But why do all these Reunion Island attacks happen so often? Well, there are many theories and many different factors that might play their role in all this. Mark Surya, a researcher at the IRD, the French National Institute for Research and Development, decided to conduct a study together with his team. They spent three years trying to collect data on 45 tiger sharks and 38 bull sharks living in local waters. The National Research Institute of France supported this study. It was also funded by three research foundations, regional, national, and European. That's when you know that the problem is serious. 
And now, here are the main theories developed by Saria's team and La Gabrielle. The first one is excessive fishing. Experts suggest that long-term fishing and catching small reef sharks, which competed with dangerous sharks for food and territory, eventually led to these dramatic consequences. Unfortunately, when predatory bull sharks ran out of food, they just had to go looking for it near the coast. For bull sharks, surfers on Reunion look like sick, weakened fish, and therefore an easy meal. Also, while in Mauritius, surfers tend to hang out near sandy beaches. On Reunion, they choose places where waves break at coral reefs. But this is exactly where the sharks choose to search for food. So, yeah. The second possible reason is muddy waters. Bull sharks like such conditions very much. And although there are no natural places like these on Reunion, the reason could be the construction of urban areas. Muddy fresh water gets into bays from cities. This water attracts sharks, and this is where the attacks take place most often. But then we can ask again, why not Mauritius? Urbanization is also in full swing there, after all. There are many places in Mauritius where sewage waters flow into the ocean. Well, then we can conclude that this is not the only factor. There have to be others. For example, there is an active volcano, Piton de la Fournaise, on Reunion Island. Thanks to this beautiful volcano, there are rich flora and fauna on the island. And this could be great if it didn't attract too much attention from predators. Because of the volcano, the shores of Reunion are less steep, which makes it easier to swim closer to the coast. And sedimentary rocks that get washed away from the slopes of the volcano can attract bull sharks. As we already know, these guys love muddy waters. There are some other theories. For example, La Gabrielle suggests that attacks may be connected to an increase in the shark population. Or maybe that's because these creatures become more aggressive during mating periods. Some people assume that all of this could be Mauritius's fault because they banned catching and selling sharks for meat. But Saria and other experts strongly disagree with this. Not many people on both islands bought this meat to make any significant difference. Anyway, this whole situation caused a lot of tension on Reunion. A big part of the population now supports the idea of catching sharks on a large scale. They also built some underwater fences near the island, and the maintenance of these fences costs a million dollars a year. It may seem pretty extreme, but drastic times require drastic measures. But despite all these terrible stories, in general, sharks aren't nearly as dangerous as we think. They almost never attack divers, unless a person provokes them. Experienced divers often compare sharks with stray dogs. These animals shouldn't be feared, but should be respected. Anyway, let's hope that La Reunion will be able to solve this problem, and people will be able to swim in its warm, beautiful waters again. It has recently become a popular location for many tourists looking for the perfect place to get away from it all. If you're lucky enough to catch a sunny day here, it's like no other, I can assure you. Chances are, you'll end up having loads of foggy days, but let's be honest, they have a special allure of their own. This enchanting smile-shaped island is called Sable Island. It's located 190 miles from mainland Nova Scotia. It wasn't accessible to the general public until 2013. That's when it was added to the list of National Parks of Canada. You can get here either by plane or by water. But what's so enchanting about this place anyway? There must be something since the yearly tourist count is growing every year. Firstly, there's a spectacular number of wild horses here. There are between 200 and 500 horses roaming free all over the island. There's also a large population of grey seals. The place is also the only breeding location of a rare bird species called the Ipswich Sparrow. If you're already considering a trip here, there are some things you need to know first. Remember that fog I mentioned earlier? Well, it turns out that Sable Island is the foggiest place in the Canadian Maritimes. I'm talking about approximately 127 foggy days each year. During such days, Sable Island literally disappears underneath a thick layer of fog. You won't be able to explore the place on your own either. The local regulations state that visitors need to travel within a group and they also need to keep a 197-foot distance from the wildlife they can encounter here. 
As charming as this place may be, it holds a dark secret hidden beneath the sandy dunes. And it has nothing to do with beautiful creatures living here or the island's unique vegetation. Apart from being known from its horses and seals, Sable Island is infamous for an overwhelming number of shipwrecks. Over the years, about 350 ships have ended their lives here, on these sandbars. When survivors described their experiences, they usually mentioned harsh weather conditions near this mysterious island. The island also made its way into literature when it was described in a book called The Perfect Storm, which was written by Sebastian Younger and published in 1997. The book was so successful that it was later adapted for the big screen in 2000, with George Clooney playing the leading role. The first recorded shipwreck near Sable Island dates back to 1583. The boat was named the HMS Delight and was under the command of British adventurer and explorer Sir Humphrey Gilbert. Only 17 people managed to survive the catastrophe by escaping in a small boat. Records mention that they spent seven days at sea before reaching the shores of Newfoundland. In 1884, another vessel named the Nicosia struggled in the thick fog as well. The ship was completely destroyed, but fortunately, all 18 crew members managed to survive. The captain's son was almost lost at sea when a lifeboat capsized when he was climbing into it. He somehow managed to stay underneath the lifeboat, which was completely submerged. When this lifeboat righted, he eventually emerged from the water and was rescued for the second time. The years between 1947 and 1999 were relatively quiet on the island. In 1999, though, a yacht called the Merrimack ran aground near the shore of the island at about 2 a.m. on July 27th. The 40-foot fiberglass boat had a crew of only three people. Natural gas exploration workers, who were luckily not far away, rescued them. The crew managed to fly safely to Halifax the next day. The owner of the Merrimack tried to recover his boat by hiring local fishermen. Unfortunately, this operation was unsuccessful, since only the fittings of the yacht were eventually saved. It took no more than six weeks for the sand and waves to crush and completely break up the hull of the Merrimack. So what is it about this place that's so dangerous for boats? Does it have anything to do with the weather? Or maybe there's other forces at play? The explanation turns out to be a bit more complex, and it wasn't easy to figure out, at least not way back in the 1500s. First of all, the island is located close to one of the world's richest fishing grounds. Since it's also near one of the major shipping routes between Europe and North America, hundreds of vessels sail past it each year. The likelihood of shipwreck increases when there are so many boats roaming around the area. Sable Island is also in the way of most of the storms that move up the Atlantic coast of North America. It's no surprise that boats often get hurtled straight onto the shores of this island. The weather has a lot to do with it too. During the summer season, the warm air from the Gulf Stream creates a dense fog as it merges with the cool air by the Labrador Current that passes by the island. Other currents don't help the matter. Sable Island is next to the meeting point of three major ocean currents, the Gulf Stream, the Labrador Current, and the Belle Isle Current. Since the 1950s, radars and other modern navigation tools have been used on commercial vessels as well. Up until then, the sextant was the main instrument used to figure out a ship's location. It doesn't mean that sextants weren't accurate, but this instrument couldn't work properly without a clear view of the sun or stars, which means it didn't help much in dense fog, such as the one surrounding Sable Island, or when it was cloudy. Often during bad weather, the captain of a ship navigated, relying on their experiences and intuition based on the ship's speed and direction. That's why most of the survivors in shipwrecks near Sable Island said that the captain had simply miscalculated the ship's position, crashing into Sable Island by accident. This dusty, sandy land is as unfriendly to ships as it is to trees. There's reportedly a single tree on the whole island, and it looks a lot more like a bush. It's actually a pine tree. And since the famous island horses don't see it as much of a food source, it somehow managed to survive. Reports say that the tree was planted back in the 1950s. Local authorities were trying to grow a forest on the island to make it a bit more welcoming. 
They've planted tens of thousands of trees over the years, more than 69,000 evergreens, 600 fruit trees, and about 55 pounds of pine seeds, along with other plants which could survive the conditions on the island. But they were no match for the extreme weather and sandy soil. Out of all those plants, just one pine tree is still alive. Thanks to its resistance, it has even become a symbol of Sable Island. Interestingly, for around 40 years, the island also had just one inhabitant. Can you imagine that? One person living on a remote island for so many decades? It's the story of a woman called Zoe Lucas. She chose to surround herself with the only residents on the island, the horses, the grey seals, and the many species of birds. An esteemed naturalist, she mentioned in an interview she gave back in 2017 that she was used to living on the island and that she never got lonely. To survive here, she had to put together an essentials kit. It included a notebook to take notes and a pair of binoculars to study the wildlife. You can safely assume she wasn't scared of the intimidating surroundings since she decided to eventually call this place home. At first, Zoe wanted to set up camp on one end of the island, near some abandoned buildings. But eventually, she settled in a wooden house near a bunch of sand dunes. A Canadian institution called the Meteorological Service of Canada put together the simple construction back in the 1940s. Parks Canada operates the building these days. Zoe's work included gathering as much data on the local horse population as possible. It could help scientists better understand how they managed to adapt to the unfriendly environment. She also helped gather the debris that made it to the shore to help track pollution levels. Among all the rubbish that she collected, there was a refrigerator and a crate full of fresh peppers. Some other specialists eventually started working rotating shifts on Sable Island to offer the brave woman a little bit of company now and then. At the beginning of the 20th century, somewhere off the coast of West Africa, a German steamship was leaving the port. Suddenly, the weather got worse and the vessel entered a thick fog. The sailors ran aground on a sandbank close to the shore. Luckily, no one was hurt, and they were even able to save their precious cargo. But the ship was stuck in the sand for good. And it was not alone there. Nearly the entire length of the western coast of Namibia is called Skeleton Coast. If the name sounds scary, that's because it is. This 976-mile-long beach line is among the most dangerous places on Earth. The local Bushmen tribes believe that their supreme deity made this land when it was angry. The Portuguese were the first Europeans to set foot in Namibia in the 15th century. And yep, they didn't like Skeleton Coast either. Portuguese explorers thought this land presented the gates to the underworld. This is the place where the Namib Desert meets the Atlantic Ocean. It might be dangerous, but it's actually beautiful. Plus, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. If Skeleton Coast had a PR manager, they would quit on the first day on the job. The area is not exactly tourist-friendly because of its geography and history. Beneath the sand and the waves, there is a secret ocean currently lurking for unsuspecting sailors. It's called Benguela Current. It flows towards the north along the coast of southern Africa. This part of the Atlantic is rich in marine life, but the current's land neighbor isn't that happy with the deal. This arid climate created the Namib Desert, one of the driest regions on Earth. And that marine life I just mentioned? It's sharks. 11 species of them to be exact. And yes, the great white decides to pop by once in a while. So far, we've got a desert landscape, strong currents, and sharks. Not a place for a beachside resort, definitely. But if someone ends up on Skeleton Coast, will they know they're in danger? Don't worry, they will. The beach is littered with wrecks of all sizes and shapes. If you remember that German ship I mentioned in the very beginning, its massive and rusted stern is now sticking out from the desert sand. There are some 500 wrecks in total scattered along the coast, and it's a mixed crowd, from Portuguese galleons centuries old to ships that ran ashore here in the 21st century. A modern fishing ship called Zela India managed to slip from its tow rope in 2008 and ended up on Skeleton Coast. Okay, it didn't escape on its own, it had some help from the elements, but it's better to be a tourist attraction on a beach than to be broken up for scrap. 
That's where the trawler was originally going. Poor thing. Skeleton Coast's most famous inhabitant, to call it such a place, is the wreck of the Dunedin Star. The British cargo liner ran aground here in 1942. The massive rescue operation that followed reveals why it's so dangerous for sailors to end up here. The rescuers managed to save all of the crew and passengers, but at a heavy price. An aircraft and a tugboat were lost in the process. It took the last of the rescuers a full two months to return home to Cape Town. Why, you might wonder? One look at the map of the region reveals the reason. It's an endless sea of yellow, which is the sand. There are so few roads here, so Skeleton Coast is hard to reach by land. There are also legal obstacles. You need a special permit to drive into the area. But the skeletons in the name of the area don't only refer to ships. They also stand for animal bones. Most of these belong to whales and seals. Many animals have adapted to the area, so lions and hyenas roam the coastline in search of a meal. Yeah, now there are hungry lions as well, as if those sharks weren't enough. Other animals with a temporary residence on Skeleton Coast include elephants, cheetahs, leopards, and giraffes. In 1971, the Namibian authorities established a national park here. But except for surfers, after an adrenaline rush, they don't get many visitors. You can understand why. The Namib Desert is the oldest desert in the world, and it's not very tourist-friendly either. Those who travel to the region should pack sunscreen and a warm winter jacket. A weird combo, right? Well, not so much when you think that during the day, temperatures soar over 110 degrees Fahrenheit. At night, the air temperature drops below freezing. What a climate roller coaster! And that's not the final danger. Yep, there's more. Remember how that German ship got lost in thick fog? Yeah, it wasn't a one off event. Because of the region's climate, fog shows up frequently. Sailors should cover their ears now, but this fog is actually good for wildlife. This is their only source of water in the Namib Desert. Reptiles and mammals have adapted to the harsh climate, they use as little water as possible. Shifting sands, thick fog, strong currents, lions, and sharks. Not the stuff you would put in a tourist booklet, but Skeleton Coast isn't the only beach on Earth you wouldn't want to spend your vacation on. I will take you to Cape Tribulation in Australia. The area covers some 48 square miles in the northwestern part of the continent. And no, the area is not as dry as Skeleton Coast. It's part of the Daintree Rainforest. You could say that here, it is the rainforest, not the desert that meets the ocean. The beach at Cape Tribulation is straight from a postcard. But looks can be deceiving. Hmm, Australia? Probably sharks. No, crocodiles are out here to get you if you decide to go for a dip in the sea. There are saltwater crocodiles that the locals call salties. Well, that's a cute nickname for such a dangerous reptile. And it's not just them. The wildlife seems to have a beef with visitors. From October to June, the waters around Cape Tribulation are full of box jellyfish. Their venom affects the human cardiovascular system. When touched by a jellyfish out at sea, swimmers won't have enough time to reach land for help. Vinegar helps neutralize the sting, so you might want to keep a spare bottle in your luggage. Crocodiles and jellyfish sound dangerous, but there is one more animal you should look after. It's the wild boar. It might sound funny, but you won't laugh when you're being chased by one of these across the beach. 21 million wild boars live in Australia. They're mostly active at night, making it even more dangerous if they charge at you. The best defense is running in circles. Wild boars can't cut corners well. That's probably why we don't see many of them taking up careers as race drivers. Cape Tribulation has one last danger installed for you, and it's not an animal. Out here, even the trees are plotting against visitors. The stinging tree got its name for a reason. If you try to pick one of its beautiful red berries, it'll fight back. Its prickles are like tiny glass shards. The less than pleasant effect on your skin will last for a month. Then there is this wait a while bush. Who keeps naming them like this? This long vine has spikes that grab hold and just don't let go. They are so strong, they can pull a human off a horse. 
You'll have to wait for someone to come by and save you from this thorny grabber. If you are about to cross this Australian beach from the vacation list, hold on for a second. Tourism is booming here. The local authorities have restricted access to all of the danger zones. Visitors go swimming in dreamy water holes that are surrounded by lush vegetation. There are even ropes to swing from. Now, that's a beach you can finally relax. More than 25 million people boarded cruise ships globally back in 2017. It may not seem like a lot, but that's more than the total population of Belgium. It's a great vacation alternative with an added bonus. You can sample various different destinations for future time off in one single trip. If you've already booked a trip on a cruise ship, but you still have no idea what you should pack, start with some research on your specific cruise location. Either way, be sure to bring deck-friendly shoes that are low-heeled. Also, add a pair that's comfortable to walk on larger distances for the days spent ashore. Depending on the season, you might want to add a few swimsuits too. If you're on any type of medication, make sure you bring it with you in its original packaging. If you're a light packer, don't worry. Most cruise ships come equipped with laundry rooms. They're kind of pricey, especially if you want your garments to be washed, ironed, and folded for you. But it does save you the extra hassle of packing more clothes or washing them for yourself. It's really important that you check in with your credit card company before boarding a ship, more so if your itinerary includes one or more foreign countries. Your credit card might get frozen if there's any unusual activity on your account. Most of these companies have algorithms that get triggered once there are charges from different countries in rapid succession. Which is exactly what you'll be doing on a cruise ship. Letting them know beforehand saves you the embarrassment of having your car declined at some fancy restaurant. To make sure you get the best room, before booking it, check out the ship's deck plan. It should be available on their website. If it's peace and tranquility you're looking for, don't go for the rooms directly above or below any of the ship's entertainment points. Also, if you have a history of getting seasick, try to skip the rooms that are available at the front of the ship. Rather, go for those located in the middle of the ship on a lower deck. You'll feel less movement. If it's your first time going on a cruise, you might be surprised to know that some cabin rooms don't have windows. Before making a reservation, make sure to check out all the amenities of the room you intend to book. Most cruise liners add a bunch of pictures from the common rooms on the reservation pages, and it might be a bit confusing as to what you're getting exactly for that specific price point. Also, some rooms on board are quite small too. If you don't like to sleep in small spaces, you might want to upgrade to a larger room, even if it's a bit pricier. You can always split the cost with a friend if they want to join you on the cruise. With the help of modern technology, even if a specific location doesn't have windows, it doesn't mean you can't watch the waves. How, you might ask? Fancier cruise ships feature a secret added bonus. In the areas with no access to sunlight, specialists have built virtual balconies. These high-tech screens work by showing you what's going on outside in real time. They have an added benefit too. In case of bad weather, guests can still have a feel of the outdoors without the wind or rain ruining their hair or their outfit. It may not be the real deal, but it still beats getting claustrophobic on board. Planning on going on a budget cruise? It might not be such a bad idea, especially if you're on the lookout for last minute upgrades. You might even end up vacationing like a millionaire without having to spend money like one. These upgrades sometimes include things like a private balcony in your room, maybe some spa services, or even better prices for high-end meals. If they aren't all booked by the time people board the ship, they might be open for the rest of the passengers for way better prices than initially listed. There might be hidden freebies on board if you pay close attention. Things like complimentary pastries on board late in the morning or a late night cup of tea on the house might be some of the things offered to guests. You only need to ask. You might want to check out what other tourists are doing. Some people with more experience cruising can offer pretty great tips and tricks. Don't be afraid to start a conversation if you see someone getting something for free. Some cruise ships do go all the way on the fancy dial. 
They even have exclusive areas designed for guests staying in expensive suites. Most of the time, they're located at the top of the ship. On one particular cruise, these types of guests have designated staff members called Royal Genies, which are similar to butlers. They can cater to just a few cabins. Since the cruise line wants to divert other guests from asking them various questions, which will take time away from their assigned guests, the Genies do not wear a name tag in public areas. Most common areas of cruise ships do require travelers to follow a dress code, but if you do your research in advance, you might find that some areas are more relaxed when it comes to what people need to wear. Most cruise ships require people to adhere to smart attire, which means pants with a collared shirt for men, or blouses and skirts, dresses, or stylish pants for the ladies. As for the travel destinations, be sure to research the ports you're about to visit in advance. You'll know what to wear, what the weather will be, and if you need to pack anything else. Like an umbrella or a beach towel. Stops on cruises only last for a few hours in most cases, so you'll want to get the most out of them. If that specific location includes museums or art galleries you want to add to your checklist, be sure to book in advance so you don't waste time waiting in lines. Some cruise ships even provide their guests with private tours of the ports they're about to visit. Do make sure to book them in advance if this is something you might be interested in, as the list gets pretty full quite fast. Independent tours are a bit more private. You can spend time with your tour guide and even ask more questions. Always remember to put your phone in airplane mode while on board. Most cruise ship horror stories involve cruising newbies that ended up paying thousands of dollars in cell phone charges while on ships just because they forgot to turn it off. If you're the type of person that can't switch off their phone, be sure to check with your cell phone provider before traveling internationally. Some can provide special plans for limited amounts of time without extra charges. You'll be free to chat, call, or browse YouTube videos without worrying you'll end up paying a fortune. Most cruise ships also provide you with complimentary Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi packages that can be purchased in advance, which are way more affordable. You can stick to communicating with your friends and family back home via FaceTime or Skype. People that have heard about the Titanic tragedy will always wonder what might happen if something goes wrong while on board. Let's take lifeboats, for instance. The Titanic had a mere 20 lifeboats on board which were tragically not enough to fit all the passengers after the ship hit the iceberg. Some fancy cruise ships these days have an even lower number of lifeboats, anywhere from 15 to 18. Sounds strange? Well, not really, given the fact that each lifeboat can accommodate up to 370 people. Even the largest ships, which have an estimated capacity of 8,000 people if fully booked, including tourists and staff, are safe in case of an emergency. Thick fog is rising over the ocean as the sun is slowly sinking towards the horizon. It's hard to see further away than a few dozen feet, but that's enough to notice a hulking, skeletal shape in the distance. As your ship approaches the figure, your heart beats faster, and then you make out the details of another vessel, abandoned by the looks of it. Ghost ships do exist, and their mysteries aren't always solved. Take MV Hoyita, for example. It was a wooden vessel built in 1931 as a luxury yacht. It had served well to various people over 20 years before it was bought by a Samoan sailor and became a merchant ship. In 1955, though, Hoyita's service came to an abrupt and mysterious end. On October 3rd, it set sail for another trading voyage that should have taken no more than 48 hours. Delays happen in the sea, so when Hoyita didn't arrive on October 5th as scheduled, there was little worry yet, but then it failed to come on the following day too. There was no distress signal or any other sign of Hoyita's presence anywhere between its departure and arrival points. A search and rescue party was dispatched to find the ship and for six days, they were scouting the area of nearly 100,000 square miles. On October 12th, the mission returned to the base empty-handed. Hoyita vanished without a trace. 
It was only a month later that another merchant ship, Tuvalu, noticed the missing vessel far away from its route, drifting in the open sea and listing heavily. The sailors boarded the ship and found that all of its crew and passengers, 25 people total, were missing along with all the cargo the vessel had been carrying. The radio was tuned to the International Distress Channel, meaning that the crew had been trying to ask for help, but they couldn't reach anyone because the radio cable had been damaged, limiting the range to two miles. The lifeboats were missing as well, indicating that people on board must have left the ship. Unfortunately, they seemed to have taken the logbook with them, leaving the rescue team clueless as to what had happened. Even today, the mystery of MV Hoita hasn't been solved yet. No one knows where the crew and passengers had gone and what had caused them to leave. SV Carol A. Deering wasn't a ghost ship in the usual sense of the word. There are no sightings of it in the open sea. Instead, it was found on the shore. But the circumstances of it running aground are a puzzle shrouded in mystery. Carol A. Deering was built in 1919 in Maine and it was a large vessel made for commercial voyages. Unfortunately, despite its large cost of construction, it had only served for a year before its last trip. July 19, 1920. The ship was traveling from Puerto Rico to Rio de Janeiro via Newport News to deliver a cargo of coal. It was almost halfway to the final destination when the captain felt seriously ill and the crew turned back to drop him and his son off and replace the captain. The voyage went without incident, but when it came to Barbados in December to resupply, there were strange moods among the crew. The first mate didn't seem to be happy with the new captain. No one paid much attention to it back then, when they probably should have. The last sighting of Carol A. Deering at sea was on January 28, 1921, when a light ship noticed it off the coast of North Carolina. There was some commotion on the quarter deck of the ship, where the crew were normally not allowed. Then, another vessel sighted it, but there was already no one on the decks. On January 31st, the merchant ship was found hard aground in the Diamond Shoals, a site notorious for numerous shipwrecks that had been occupying there for centuries. When the search and rescue party boarded the ship, they found it abandoned, the log and personal belongings of the crew gone, along with the two lifeboats. There is still no answer to what happened on board of Carol A. Deering that January. Although, the most popular version was mutiny. Maybe we'll never find out the truth, though. SS Bechimo is perhaps one of the most notable ghost ships in history. This large cargo steamer was built in 1914 in Sweden and plotted its way dutifully over 16 years, trading provisions for pelts with native tribes of Alaska and Canada. But then, on October 1st, 1931, Bechimo got caught in pack ice. At first, it seemed the crew would be able to wait it out and continue on their route because the ship broke free in a couple of days. But in less than a week, it became caught again, this time for good. In another week, a rescue party was sent to fetch 22 of the Bechismo's crew, while another 15 remained behind to wait through the winter if necessary and get the ship back. But a month later, after a powerful blizzard struck their camp, the sailors went out of their shelters only to find the ship gone. Luckily, a few days later, a native hunter told them Bechimo hadn't been lost yet. He'd seen it about 45 miles from where they had been stationed. They managed to track it down, but decided the ship wouldn't survive the winter. So they took the most valuable cargo from its hold and abandoned it. They were wrong though. SS Bechimo did survive that winter and many more that followed. When the ice broke, it sailed away on its own, drifting listlessly along the shores of Canada and Alaska. There were numerous sightings of the ghost ship, sometimes adrift in the open sea, and at other times stuck in the pack ice again. People attempted to board and salvage it, but weather conditions or lack of equipment always prevented them. SS Bechimo was last sighted by native Alaskans in 1969, 38 years after its abandonment. What became of it later remains unknown. The story of SS Orang Maidan is one of the most puzzling and harrowing ghost ship stories of the 20th century. 
No one even knows for sure if the ship even existed in the first place. It wasn't recorded in Lloyd's Shipping, the International Register of Ships, which makes it either a tall tale or a vessel that avoided being officially recognized for some shady reasons. In any case, the accounts as to what happened to the Maidan vary. According to most reports, it was carrying some unknown cargo in the Indonesian waters when a distress call was received by another ship in the vicinity. The officer on duty heard an SOS message, but its contents are different depending on the accounts. The message did not repeat, and the crew of Maidan didn't answer to any attempts to contact it back. The ship that received the distress call hurried to the rescue, but they only reached the vessel the following day when it was already drifting and slightly listing. When the rescuers boarded the ship, they found that none of the crew had survived. However, one lifeboat was missing, which implied that there was at least one crew member who managed to escape. What happened to the rest of the people on board remains a mystery to this day. Still, there are no hard facts about this story, so we might never find out whether SS Orang Maidan was actually a ship and not a thing of fiction. SV Zabrina was a three-mast sailing barge built in 1873 for river trade ships in South America. She served for well over four decades, proving to be a sturdy and reliable ship. It was later transferred to Europe, where it continued serving its purpose well. But then, in October 1917, Zabrina set sail on a regular voyage only to be found ashore several days later. Mysteriously, although the ship was perfectly intact, the entire crew of five and the captain were gone. There is no direct evidence or hard facts as to what really happened that day. The most convincing theory is that the crew were washed away from the deck because of an underwater explosion. And then the ship sailed ahead without them. But the truth, as always, remains unknown. The ship's mast groans under the weight of the open sails. A light wind moves the boat towards new horizons, new hope, and the new world. When Columbus discovered America, the world changed forever. At the end of the 15th century, European colonization of unknown inviting land, storing precious treasures, unexplored secrets, and great danger began. Some of you know how difficult it is to build a camp for several people on an expedition. You spend a lot of time setting up tents, making bonfires, gathering firewood, and cooking. Now imagine how difficult it is to create a large colony and build a city. And what about the country? You have no connection to the continent, the internet, or modern technology. You obtain food supplies and building materials on the island through hard work or wait for several months until a large ship reaches you. And there's no guarantee that it will come. It can get caught in a storm, go off course, or disappear mysteriously. Europeans were living in such conditions for centuries when they were colonizing the New World and building the United States of America. In addition to the obvious risks and dangers, they faced something sinister and unknown. For example, there were cases when entire colonies disappeared without a trace, and no one knew what happened to them. Perhaps they awakened something evil and inexplicable, or got lost in the forests of early America, or something much worse. One such case occurred with the Roanoke colony at the end of the 16th century. So far, none of the scientists and researchers have solved the mystery of the tragic disappearance of about a hundred people. In 1587, a group of settlers consisting of 115 people, with John White as their leader, was rapidly approaching the shores of America on a large cargo ship. John stared forward confidently. He was determined to establish a new territory for his country and build a house for his family. Besides experienced sailors, travelers, and builders on board the ship, there was John White's wife and his daughter with her husband. They all sailed to an island called Roanoke, this piece of land was a fort and, in the future, would be the beginning of modern North Carolina. However, John White didn't know yet at what price it would be done. The group leader was confident in his abilities because this was not the first attempt to establish a colony there. The first two times the British tried to build a fort post on the island ended with a series of failures. A lack of food supplies and other problems prevented colonization. But not everything was so bad. 
The previous settlers learned that there were precious metals somewhere on the island, and anyone who found them would become wealthy. Everything was supposed to work out this time. John White was sure of it and was prepared for the new attempt. So at last, the ship docked to the shore. The whole crew got to the ground. Everyone was excited about new opportunities on the new land, so they quickly started building a new home. John White supervised the construction, explored the island, and established contacts with the natives. The settlers spent every day working hard, building houses, making fires, and cooking food. And despite the difficult conditions, the team settled in, and John White's daughter gave birth to a daughter. However, soon, the standards of living began to deteriorate. Cold weather was approaching, and the supplies of food and building materials were quickly running out. Remembering the experience of the previous settlers, John White decided not to bring the situation to a critical point, so he went to England to get provisions in advance. He calculated that he could return before people ran out of supplies, so he left his wife, daughter, and granddaughter in Roanoke. He set off on a month-long journey back to England with a small team. Always keeping in mind that his family was waiting for him on the island, he came to the residence of Queen Elizabeth I immediately upon arrival to ask for a new cargo of food. However, while he was sailing to England, some events happened that interfered with his plans. His country came into conflict with Spain. The Queen ordered the return of all ships sailing for the New World. She decided to gather a fleet to fight the opponent. The shipment of provisions to the island where John White's family lived was cancelled. It's not known how the group leader reacted to these events, but he probably went crazy because of his inability to fix anything. Using all his connections and influence, John White managed to get a ship with provisions. However, it happened only three years after his return to England. He understood that the settler supplies had most likely run out by this time, and he had no idea what had happened to his family. With a new team, he quickly set off for the new world. A few months later, he saw the familiar outlines of the shore. The closer the ship got to the land, the more John White's excitement grew. He looked through a spyglass, but saw no signs of life on the island. When he came ashore, he immediately ran towards the settlement. He found houses they had built together destroyed. All trunks were looted. There was an ominous silence and no people. The colony seemed to have disappeared. John White realized something bad had happened to his people and his family. Perhaps they went somewhere in search of food supplies. Or maybe someone or something made them run away. England started several investigations to find out what had happened, but didn't get any answers. The only clue John White found was the word Croatoan scratched into a wooden post. For centuries, historians have been trying to unravel the disappearance of the colony. They put forward different versions. Some believed that the local tribes had attacked the colony, and others thought the settlers had gone inland in search of food and had just gotten lost. There was also a version that local tribes had put a curse on people, and they had faced some phantom sinister force. However, the first version seemed the most realistic, because Croatoan meant the name of the island where the tribes lived. Perhaps they waited until John White left the settlement and attacked the British. Of course, this version was also tested. People visited the island but found no traces of settlers there, and locals said they hadn't seen the disappeared colony. According to another version, the settlers tried to return to England after waiting for John White for some time. They were unsure whether the leader would come back, so they decided not to wait for the supplies to finish and went to England on the ships of other settlers sailing there. Who knows, maybe they got into a storm and disappeared at sea. Perhaps they met Spaniards with whom the British had a conflict. But all these are guesses that have no evidence. We would have never known what happened to the Roanoke colony if, in 2012, Elizabethan era researchers hadn't discovered the mark of an unknown fort drawn in invisible ink on John White's map. That place was only 50 miles from Roanoke. After discovering the new clue, archaeologists traveled to North Carolina to find a secret fort. They arrived at the place and found many fragments of English pottery lying on the ground. Among them, there were pots and jars for storing and cooking food, 
There was also a Native American village not far from this location. There's a version that the colony split up. One group went to the island of Croatoan to wait for John White. Before that, they scratched this word on a tree as a hint. The second group went deep into the country and settled in that secret place marked on the map. In the future, researchers may find definite answers to all these questions. But until that happens, the disappearance of the Roanoke colony is still one of the most famous mysteries in American history. There's a heavy snowstorm. The cold penetrates his bones. His legs are almost knee-deep in snow. Experienced hunter Joe LaBelle makes his way through the forest, covering his face from the headwind. Any other person would have already fallen and screamed in despair, but not Joe LaBelle. He can survive in any circumstances and always knows what to do. Right now, he's heading to one of the villages in the far north of Canada. This small settlement is located on Lake Anjakuni. The inhabitants of this village are Inuit, indigenous people of North America. Joe hasn't eaten or drunk for a long time. He needs a good sleep and a hot meal, which he hopes to get from the hospitable Inuits. Through trees and a white haze, he notices the silhouettes of tents. Smoke is coming from some houses. Joe will probably get there in time for lunch. He reaches the village and, at this moment, the wind calms down. The blizzard has ended. The hunter speeds up and goes toward the village, located along the frozen lake. It's strange, but there are no locals anywhere. Probably everyone is just sitting in their houses, waiting out the blizzard. Hello, Joe says loudly, but gets no response. Oh, great, smoke is coming out of this tent. Joe knocks on the wall, but no one opens it. He knocks a few more times and goes inside. The little tent is empty. All things are in their places. There's a piece of cloth with needles and thread on the table. Firewood is smoldering in the fireplace. It seems that people have just left this place. Joe goes into the next tent and sees the same picture. All things are in their places, but there are no people. Joe walks past the tents and sees a pit where a bonfire once burned. There's a rope above it with the meat that the Inuit were cooking hanging on it. For some reason, they didn't eat it. Lake Anjakuni is part of a chain of waterways. Here, the Inuits fished and traded various goods. Usually, there are many people here, but now something has forced them to leave their homes. Why did they leave their things behind? And where did they go? There are no tracks around the village. All the sleds are in place. The Inuits have even left their dogs here and dogs help them to hunt and ride sleighs. No one will leave warm clothes and dogs here when moving away, especially in severe weather. Joe LaBelle knows all this, so he concludes that something terrible has happened here. His body is shaking, not from the cold, but from fear. After going around the entire settlement, he finds not a single soul. Terrified, he leaves the village heads for the nearest telegraph pole, and sends a message to the police. After a while, more and more people arrive. The police are trying to find traces of missing people and figure out what has happened. But there's nothing. Near the village, they find an empty grave. During the ceremony, the Inuits placed stones around the burial site. The rocks around the open pit lie untouched which means it wasn't an animal that dug it up. But who or what needed it? About 30 people lived in the village, and they're all gone. Local residents from neighboring villages can't help, since they have no idea what has happened. The only thing that the police have noticed is unusual blue lights. In this area, the northern lights are a common phenomenon. People living here regularly see a glow in the starry sky. But the police have seen something else, pulsing blue lights. Also, other hunters have witnessed something similar. They say that some strange things were flying in the sky. This all happened in 1930. 
It's been almost 90 years since the disappearance of the village, and people have created a bunch of theories. The most popular of them is an attack of an extraterrestrial civilization. According to this theory, the blue lights in the sky that the locals and the police saw were spaceships. Some believe that one ominous night, these ships flew to the settlement and took away all the people. In addition to these sci-fi versions, there were also more realistic ones. Internet users have found out that Joe LaBelle didn't have a hunting license. Maybe he wasn't a professional and made it all up. But at that time, many hunters didn't have a license, so Joe's words may be true. But if we try to find out where all this information came from, we'll see that the primary sources were books and some newspaper articles from the 30s. But none of them can confirm that the mysterious story of Lake Anjakuni is true. Perhaps this entire story was made up. Now let's leave the snows of Canada and head for the hot plains of India. In this big country, there's one sinister village where people also disappeared without a trace. This happened in the first half of the 19th century. Still, locals avoid this place even now because they believe that invisible evil forces live there. Let's check and find out what happened to the village of Kuldara. It's located in the district of Rajasthan. To get there, you can use a taxi to get to the nearest village or city. The village is located far from other settlements. It looks deserted. There are only ruins. It looks like archaeologists have recently dug this place out of the ground and left it here. But this is not an ancient city. The village was abandoned more than 200 years ago. But up to that point, this place had been thriving. Kuldara was a large village. Local people were mostly farmers. They sold their agricultural products. And then, one night, everything changed. People abandoned their homes and stuff and ran away from there. No one knows why they did it and no one knows where they went. Nobody has ever seen the inhabitants of Kuldara again. Apart from tourists, almost no one comes here. The locals are sure that the village is cursed and is the center of paranormal activity. If you ask residents of other nearby towns or read the information on the internet, you'll learn a couple of legends about this place. One popular version says that people left this village because of a lack of water However, this version doesn't explain why the residents did it overnight and left their things behind. According to another version, the villagers ran away to save the daughter of the Kuldara chief. One local ruler fell in love with her and wanted to marry her. He threatened the locals with grave consequences if the girl rejected him. The ruler gave them one day to make a decision. The residents disagreed with such a requirement. As a sign of solidarity, they decided to leave the village together with the chief and his daughter. But if this is true, why did no one else see these people? They must have escaped to another settlement. In addition, they needed their things on the way there. The stories of Kuldara and Lake Anjakuni have one thing in common. People left a comfortable and safe place for an unknown reason. A similar story happened in Ireland with a small village on the island of Ackle. About 40 simple houses made of stone and straw were located along the valley of Keem Bay. The village was mentioned in documents dated back to the 1830s as a group of small buildings. But today, there's practically nothing left of it except pieces of walls and small mounds of ground. People from other settlements don't remember this village, but we know about it thanks to the records of travel writers. They describe the incredible beauty of this place and the village in their diaries. Students of the local archaeological school tried to find the answers. They started excavations and discovered